Okay. It's good to see you again. It's been a little while. It has. It yeah. has. We had a, you had a, a break. You took, you were um, getting together with your family and doing some family things. And I've been busy moderating Reddit like a madman. So we got a new moderator on Skinwalker Ranch, Toxic Toy. Um, she's not new to moderating. She's just new to moderating our subreddit. She was a moderator on our UFOs for quite a while. She's been a moderator on our experiencers. She's moderated other things. Um, she's also an experiencer, and she's a huge fan of Skinwalker Ranch and, and a member of the Insiders. So she's kind of got all the bases covered there. And yeah, I think, you know, she's she's going to be a good fit. She's kind of going hands off a lot at first while she observes to see how we do things. And she's just asking questions right now, which is great. Um, so, yeah, I, that's a huge relief because that subreddit's just grown. It's doubled in size since I became a moderator. Um and I just couldn't keep up towards the end there. So I'm really happy that we've we've got somebody else, you know, on call, so to speak, to help out. Because I'm sure the subreddit's only going to get a heck of a lot bigger, especially when the new season starts. Yeah, yeah. We also saw a big influx of new visitors, subscribers, whatever you want to call on Reddit, uh, after season four ended, the season finale. That got a lot of interest. Uh, and also beyond Skinwalker Ranch. Their season finale was with Chris Bledsoe, uh, <laughs> which was pretty amazing. Um, the other thing that was interesting is some of the the podcasts, the discussions that have happened since then. Um, so we'll maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. But we're, what we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a little bit of a trend. Uh, people are kind of freaking out. You know, Brandon promised that some people would need therapy after season four. Um, I don't know whether that's true or not, <laughs> but. We do have people that are like going, "Wow, this is this is actually real." Um, even my own my own spouse uh, reacted fairly emotionally to that season finale. When you know when you saw the orbs going in and out of the mesa, uh, just the overwhelming amount of data, you know, undeniable scientific proof at this point. So you have done something recently um, to help everybody out, and so can you you want to introduce the topic for the podcast? Yeah, so we're going to be talking today about ontological shock, which is a term that gets thrown thrown around a lot. Um, but it's also something that I personally have been seeing a lot of people posting on our UFOs and our experiencers being like, guys, I kind of think this stuff might be real and I'm sort of freaking out and I'm having trouble sleeping. And, you know, we've seen some people have full on kind of meltdowns. Um, and some of that is even ongoing, you know, we're kind of worried about some of the people because this can be, this is a big deal. I mean, this really is ontological shock is not just a matter of like being like, Ooh, that's surprising. I mean, it, it really is shock. This is a, almost like PTSD, but the root of it, you know, the word ontology, it means the the entire belief system that you have, the, the way reality operates is an ontology. And ontological shock means that this is challenged in a fundamental way. So, you know, it's not just maybe being like, oh, UFOs are real, but then you go, well, if UFOs are real, then aliens are real. And if aliens are real, then how long have they been here and what have they been doing? And then you start reading up and you're like, oh my God, they've been They've been interfering with people. They've been doing this. What are their capabilities? What can they do? They kind of act, behave like gods. Is God real? You know, and then all of a sudden you're like rocketing down a slope on a sled with a jet engine on it. And all these questions start coming up. And if you're somebody who's had an experience, which is often what really triggers ontological shock, it's not something you can just kind of shelve it, set it to the side and ignore it. You've got to, you've got to incorporate that into your reality, and and that can be incredibly hard. And people, you will hear people, and this is not just again people who've like had an alien encounter, or seen a UFO, or whatever. This this is people who've had near death experiences, for example, 
and they come back from the near death experience and even though it might have been entirely positive you know this overwhelming sense of love and they meet some sort of higher being and and they come back and they've got a sense of purpose and they're like oh my god my life has changed in a positive way it's very common for people to lose their job their their marriage friendships all of these things go by the wayside because this person becomes almost like a new person everything about their thought patterns changes and their belief system changes. And, you know, we are seeing this right now. And I think it's it's only going to become more of a problem as time goes on. Because, you know, we're having these hearings in Congress. More information is coming out. At some point in this conversation, we'll probably touch on what's going on with the whole flight MH370 thing. Because it's kind of relevant. And what's going on with Skinwalker Ranch. So, you know, when Brandon said the whole thing about, you know, some people are going to need therapy, he was really talking about ontological shock. Because, you know, what they're experiencing on their end is, is hard to get across in a TV program. You know, you get an hour a week and they've got stuff going on there all the time. You know, Eric's living there on site and they're capturing all these things. A lot of it doesn't go in the show. They don't know what to make of it. And, you know, I think season five is just going to be a lot more of that. And so when I think when we get to that point, you know, there really are going to be a lot of people who are struggling and trying to figure out how to incorporate this. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And we're going to be talking about not only like, you know, what is ontological shock? How is that experienced? But what you can do about it uh, to try and help. So, yeah, it's going to be I think it's going to be a lengthy topic and we're going to, as we always do, kind of wander around to related things as we go. So, yeah. Yeah, um, this is a tough subject for me to talk about, honestly, because I've experienced ontological shock. I, I didn't know what the term meant I, when I first heard on it. You know, what is ontological shock? For me, it was just a shattering of my worldview where it, it's like dropping a it's like dropping a glass and it just shatters and you've got you've got your you know your beliefs inside that glass like a liquid and it hits the ground and it just shatters and the, and the liquid just goes everywhere you you can't put it back together it's Humpty Dumpty on the wall right it, it, it it's your worldview shattered and the first place that I went was not feeling safe anymore when you don't have a worldview you know what you worry about is your your own personal safety um and then it very quickly devolves into, you know, those almost survival instincts. You get this feeling in your gut, you know, that sort of is something threatening my survival here. And this this whole topic of the paranormal and, you know, down to the trickster on the ranch, you know, Brandon just did an interview last week with a guy named Sean Ryan, where he said he declared that they have actually made contact with the precognitive non-human intelligence on the ranch. Um, that's, that's pretty intense. And he got into some pretty good, big detail. And he said this next season, uh, you know, next year in season five, they're, they're going to, they're going to explore more on how to actually not only continue with the contact, but also communicate with it. And, you know, I'm just sitting there going, what? I mean, this is just WTF bomb after WTF bomb. Um, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> It's a sense of foreboding and um, a threat to your security all the way down, in my opinion. At least that's been my experience. So you're, the write-up you just did on our experiencers, that's, is that where you posted it or are UFOs? I posted it on our experiencers. Okay. Um, and I've posted similar things on our UFOs before, and they don't get the same reception. And I think a lot of it is because people are just like, eh, ontological shock. You know, they don't understand what it means. People on our experiencers generally do because a lot of them have been through it already or are still in it. Yeah. So can you kind of, is it like the grief process? Do you want to sort of step through what you put in that article? And uh, by the way, anyone who um, who wants to read that article, we're going to add that in the description below, a link directly to your article so that they can read it. Um, we're not going to be able to cover all of it here. And you've got a lot of links, a lot of science behind it. Um, but can you sort of step us through there's like an event, right? You're exposed to something. There, there's a kickoff. Something happens, right? And kind of go, Is there are there specific stages here? 
Well, you know, I think like anything else, it's different for everyone. Um, but the stages themselves, you know, not everybody experiences all of them. Um, people experience them differently. But there's a lot of commonalities and, and overlap there. Um, and I've actually, I, I have notes because this is a complicated subject. And so. Yeah. You know, know the other thing I like about your article, Charles, while you're, while you're finding that is you spend a lot of time, this is almost like a research paper. This isn't just you, you know, popping off and it's basically peer reviewed because you're on our experiencers and you get a lot of comments, a lot of feedback, uh, a lot of corrections in some cases. Right. So this is like a peer reviewed, you know, crowdsourced information source on this. And I haven't seen anything like this on the internet. I, I Googled ontological shock and it was all over the place, but there was nothing concrete like your, your, your document. So yeah, let's step us through it. Well, and people use different terms for it as well. Another term that uh, I've seen used is spiritual emergency. Mm. And this again, kind of refers more to people who have NDEs because, you know, they're viewed spiritually, but it applies to all of this because these things are are connected, um, and that's something that you will you will discover if you dive into these topics is that UAP, non-human intelligence, spirits, consciousness, all of these things are intricately connected, and you can't really separate them out. And so, if you and psychedelics, by the way, you know people using psychedelics and and the experience that they have after that, that is often a life-changing thing for people. And so there's a, you know, there's a lot of commonalities that that go along with that. Um, you know, one of them is is this idea of feeling very challenged by it. It's just, I mean, it's it's overwhelming to the point of being debilitating. And it I think the best way to it, the best analog for it for most people, I think, is PTSD very similar it's just the you know what the root cause is but there's a lot of commonalities there most people are familiar with the you know concept of ptsd i think a lot of people think it's something that only vets can get you know you have to be in a war zone to get it not true you can have any sort of traumatic experience uh, having a bad car crash where you think that you're going to die and then you don't can trigger ptsd and so you know that 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 difficulty in dealing with that um that's one of the big components of it it's really hard to get through and i think you know we're going to talk about steps to deal with it but i just want to start off by saying i encourage everybody to get some sort of therapy or mental health support going through this you don't necessarily have to tell you know the mental health professional like for example if you think you've been abducted by aliens or whatever if you're not comfortable telling him all the details on that hold back what you're comfortable with you don't want to lie to them the more information they have to work with the better but that is something that is really not well regarded by you know the mental health world right now because it's not in the dsm you know the dsm is the manual that is used by mental health professionals for all of the different types of disorders and how they're categorized and how they're treated and you know alien abduction if you look that up it'll just say c psychosis you know so so you kind of have to be a little wary there there are open minded professionals out there but you kind of got to tease it out of them because if you go in there with a lot of people and you just say you know i had an encounter last night and aliens came through my wall and then they paralyzed me and then they took me out of my body and we went on a spaceship and you know blah 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 blah, blah. and then they put me back probably what is going to happen is the mental health professional is going to write down visual hallucinations you know um delusions they're going to put these types of things down because that's what they're trained in and that's what they know because alien abduction is not accepted in western society i don't even know if it's accepted in any society are, are you familiar with anything, Dean? No, I'm not. Uh, uh, like you said, this is not really in the books, right? Uh, from what I can tell online, a lot of people end up getting messed up. Uh, we got to be really careful because you know there's a fine line between 
you know, an experience and maybe just a health, mental health crisis that may have some of these same symptoms. And you and I are not mental health professionals at all. You're, you're sort of approaching this from a philosophical perspective, maybe even a spiritual perspective, but we're not providing any kind of mental health advice. W would you say that ontological shock is always a mental health crisis or just sometimes? And can people get through this by themselves with loved ones or do you feel like no matter what level of ontological shock, it does need some kind of a professional mental health professional to, to step somebody through that? It depends on how it's affecting the person. And I'm going to, to read off here because we did get a comment from somebody who is a practicing mental health professional. Um, and they commented and they were like, this is a great post. This is how they determine whether somebody really needs support or not. There were four questions. Am I able to get up and eat and move and, you know, take a bath and, you know, do all of the things I need to do on a day-to-day -day basis? That's the first one. The second one is, am I able to maintain healthy relationships with my friends and family? That's the second one. Third one, am I able to advocate for myself and communicate my preferences for, you know, my care and how I'm treated? And then the fourth one is, Am I able to learn any things to help me deal with the situation better? If you can do all of those things, then you don't necessarily need any, any assistance. Um, but if you're struggling with any one of them or, you know, multiples, then it does behoove you to go and, and get genuine mental health support. And again, yes, I want to underline that. I am not a licensed mental health professional. I have experience going to them. Um, but yeah, I'm not giving anybody any medical advice here. I would say this is this is more practical and, and as you said, maybe philosophical advice. Right, right. This this is this is a tough subject, you know, especially with our audience, considering that I've got a feeling that we have some people that are listening to this, either right now or in the future, who are struggling with this. They already know where they're at. And they're like, oh yeah, this is the boat I'm already in. And then we've got a, a group of people that don't know what we're talking about or have not heard about this yet and don't really understand it. Um, and so, you know, there's there's an aspect of talking about advice that that we can give those kinds of, of people in their journey where they can help someone else in their life, right? A, a family member, a loved one that needs help stepping through this. And then I think we've got another little gray area where someone knows they're going to be facing this very, very soon. So they're okay now, but they know that this is coming down the pike for them. Does that make sense? So so there's sort of advice for them. Okay, if you feel like it's building up, you're, you're seeing things, you're learning things, you know, books are banging you in the, in the head like happened to me in a bookstore, <laughs> right? And you pick it up and you look at it and you're like, you know, I'm on some kind of a journey here. Um, what would you, I, I threw out three things there. What? what where do you want to start? Well, let me continue to kind of go through this list I've got in front of me um, of some of the things that people experience that are signs of ontological shock, and they could be associated with other things as well. Um, but if you're listening to this, watching this, and you're like, oh, I've got that, and I've got that, and I've got that, um, then you might actually be experiencing it and not realize it, which sounds surprising. But while I was putting that post together and kind of going through it, I realized I'm kind of in that state myself again right now. And I've been through this before in the past, um, but I continue to have different experiences. And every time I have to incorporate these experiences, and I may get into some detail on that to kind of explain why I ended up in ontological shock. So we talked a little bit about, you know, that feeling of being really stressed out and, and having difficulty functioning. Um, you can be incredibly distracted. That's a huge sign. You can't concentrate on anything. You can't focus. You're constantly forgetting things. Um, you can also start having, and this is where, you know, a psychiatrist might say you're having delusions. You might be having some unusual ideas because you're trying to take these things that you've been presented with and incorporate them and go, how does this make sense in a logical, rational world? Is that's really what this is all about is, you know, everybody has their day-to-day -day existence and there's consensus reality. 
and the idea of that being like, this is what people, if you talk to anybody else about an experience and consensus reality, they know what you're talking about. They've been through it. You start going outside of that. You start having experiences that are anomalous in nature. And people are going to be like, mm, I, I don't really, I don't under, I don't know what you mean. I don't, I'm, I can't connect with you. I don't understand what you're talking about. And, you know, the further away they start getting where they're like questioning things and pondering and trying to understand and sort it out, um, the more disconnected they're going to seem from reality. And so they might start to seem delusional when, in fact, they are trying to rationalize something that they experience. So it may not be that they're delusional at all. It may just be that they're they're trying to think through this logically and struggling or, or having to go to real large extremes to fit in, you know, I experienced this thing. How does this fit into this world? Well, maybe this, and then maybe this and this, and this, and it would have to be this and this, and then I could finally get all this stuff to, to make sense. Um, there was a graphic that I included and maybe we can, we can include this as well. We could throw it up or something, put it in the show notes um, where I had two pools of liquid different colors and they're touching and one of them i labeled mental health disorder and the other one was anomalous experience and where these two pools of liquid come together there's not a hard delineation they blend into each other and I, this is the real problem because there are genuine mental health disorders like schizophrenia and a lot of the symptoms of those are identical to what people will have with these anomalous experience even if they don't have schizophrenia and then the person who is experiencing it struggles being like, am I losing it? Am I going crazy? And the mental health professional is also going to have difficulty trying to be like, eh, what? I don't really know what is happening here. And that's, again, where they go back and they assess and they're like, are you able to function? Are you, able, you know, is it impacting your friends and family, et cetera? And then they might prescribe therapy or, you know, try and get you on medication or whatever. So you might have all of these really aberrant thoughts, um, which can result in weird behaviors. So an example of that might be, let's say you got telepathic communication and the nature of that communication might be like, you know, you need to do this thing. And this is very common is that people are told they need to do something. Uh, and then they're struggling like, well, what happens if I don't do that? You know, like what? Um, well, I'm trying to think of an example um, that isn't one that I've personally gone through <laughs> because I, without diving into the whole backstory on that at this point, um, it's going to be hard for people to understand. And I think I may get into it later on in this conversation, depending on how we're doing on time and how we're feeling. Um, but I'm not ready to get there quite yet. So hang in there and I'll get back to you on that, if that's okay. Um, can you think of an example? Well, I've seen some online, um, you know, where people have an experience and they have some kind of telepathic communication. Some people that even see orbs. I mean, this is the simplest stuff. Um, once you see an orb, you cannot unsee it. And they get the sensation that they need to, you know, be concerned about the planet. Right. Maybe they need to join an organization, you know, to help them with the environment or some of them feel like they need to start doing art. Uh, or write a song, something like that. So their their creative juices start flowing and they start getting impressions that they need to do that kind of things. Those are some of the examples I've seen online. Uh, or or does it get deeper? Is it, they got to take off their trash or pay their taxes or, I mean. It, yeah, it can be, but those are, those are good examples. Um, not eating meat is one. Oh, really? And then people, yeah, people are sometimes told, you know, you shouldn't be eating meat. You're, you're harming animals or whatever. That's unnecessary. This is frequently communicated by, um, I'll, I'll say aliens, um, non-human intelligence is too broad. So I'll say aliens, people who have contact experiences are often told they're discouraged from eating meat. And then they're like, well, should I do that? Or should I not? And if, if you tell somebody like, oh, I heard voices and they told me not to eat meat, that's not going to, you know, that's not going to be respected very well, unless this person knows you and they're like, you know, okay, I guess I can see where you're coming from. But if you just told a random person on the street, you heard voices, and then you started doing what the voices told you to do, you're not going to be respected for that. 
it's very, very hard for people to to understand that because everybody knows that this is what schizophrenics experience. You know, they're told this kind of stuff all the time. And the voices are theoretically coming from their own subconscious and they can't tell. They may know that it's a hallucination, but they still feel a compulsion to do it. And this is why I'm like, there's overlap. There's significant overlap here between these two things. And it's kind of a matter of, you know, how much is happening at once in terms of, you know, number of symptoms that are being experienced. That would be one of the things I think a mental health professional would look at trying to determine if it's that versus ontological shock or trying to, you know, just integrate an anomalous experience. And so people will also end up with, you know, ethical dilemmas because they're getting new kind of spiritual transformation as a result of the experience itself or messages that are communicated to them. And so then they start questioning their behaviors and they're like, gosh, I don't know if I've been a bad person, my life, you know, they start judging themselves and that can, that in itself can lead to, you know, severe depression. If you're kind of going, oh my gosh, all these things that I was doing throughout my life, I didn't think they really mattered. And and now, you know, because I had this near-death experience or whatever, I realized that all those things were actually really important. And I've been, you know, I've just been this horrible person. Not like you're going to go to hell or anything, but, you know, you've got to kind of integrate your past behaviors. This is something that alcoholics go through when they're in recovery is having to deal with all of the actions that they made when they were drunk. So there's there's overlap with all of these different types of, of traumas and, and mental health issues. And it's one of the reasons why it's just so hard to sort this out. Why on the experience or subreddit, we forbid any like basic discussion of like mental health diagnosis. You're not allowed to tell somebody, oh, that sounds like you know, psychosis or schizophrenia or whatever. We also discourage people from even saying, I had a schizophrenia diagnosis, simply because nobody will listen to them after that. And, you know, I think a lot of people can end up with a schizophrenia diagnosis, even though they don't have schizophrenia, simply because they experienced enough anomalous things in a way that they couldn't incorporate, that the mental health professional heard it and went, well, they're, they've lost it. They're out there. This kind of stuff isn't real. And it's, it's so difficult. It really is. And, but it needs to be taken more seriously because more and more people are going to start experiencing this, I think, as time goes on, even if it's from nothing else other than what's coming out through these UFO hearings or just through Skinwalker Ranch. For some people, the evidence that they get is going to be enough for them to trigger that sort of questioning of what is really happening? Like, what is the nature of things? You said your wife had that experience, right? With the season finale of... It, you know, it wasn't full on, you know, ontological shock or anything like that. It was, it's more like, you know, wow, this is, this is pretty compelling evidence at this point. You know, if, if you watched all the four seasons and, and now they're seeing orb, the stuff that they've gotten just the last a couple of episodes was just absolutely over the top uh, in terms of evidence. And, and then on top of that, if you, you know, back that up with beyond Skinwalker ranch and you're seeing, you know, Chris Bledsoe with a, with a helmet, you know, when they're analyzing all these brain waves and he's pointing up in the sky and orbs are appearing. At some point you're going, wait a minute, this, this isn't just another ghost show. This isn't, this isn't the curse of Oak Island here. This is something much more profound. It doesn't really necessarily cause full blown on ontological shock, but it's it's one of the it's one of the straws, right? <laughs> on the camel's back. It is. Yeah. And and that's the thing. It's like in order to generally trigger the shock, it has to be in a way that you can't easily deny it anymore. You know, because you can rationalize this stuff away. You can debunk literally anything. If you want, you can debunk anything. But if you if you view this stuff with an open mind, and Brandon, you know, is hammering on this all the time, not just Brandon, also, you know, Eric and Travis and all these people when they've given these interviews, they're like, look, if you don't come at this with like um, a negative 
perspective when you're trying to um, evaluate these things. You know, if you don't come at it with the perspective of, oh, it's all BS and they have to persuade me it isn't, you know, you come at it in the positive one of they're telling the truth or they may be telling the truth. What evidence do they have? And then you look at the evidence, then you go, what, what the hell is going on? Because it's, especially when you start getting the perspective from other professionals in the field, like they're bringing in all these outside professionals who are like, we can't explain this. We've got, you know, decades of experience and, and we don't know what to tell you. And that's part of the problem, you know, is that people are like, I haven't seen any proof that there's a, a wormhole, for example. On the property there's no proof there's a wormhole it's like well there's literally no scientific perfect definition of exactly what a wormhole would be and exactly how it would operate and what the signs of that would be so they have to guess they have to make their best guess on well what would we look for and how would we test for that and that's what they've been doing they've been trying to figure out well you know what can we do to try and we know it behaves in these certain ways. How can we stimulate that? You know, they. one of the first things Travis had them do was let's shoot a rocket at it and see what happens. And they were like, oh, we got a response. Well, let's try it again. They got a response again. And so the reason why Travis keeps shooting rockets up at this thing is because they're getting a consistent response out of it. You know, it's kicking the hornet's nest. And so they're doing that, but all they're getting out of it is they're getting weird results. And they're going, well, we, we have to get enough weird results that we can start to form a hypothesis and then be able to figure out if we can test it, you know, in order to get a firm conclusion. The conclusion they have, which they told us on a previous episode of our show, was that it's non-human intelligence on the ranch. Brandon went so far as to say it was malevolent. Um, Eric was more reserved in that regard, but he did say that he believed, and he could always change his mind, that it was non-human intelligence. And I'm sure that they both went through ontological shock when they realized this, when they were like, you know, okay, so there's something here and it's not limited to the ranch because, you know, you get these reports all over the world, but now they're going to all these other locations with the Beyond Skinwalker Ranch and they're testing these other sites. And they're going, we're finding, you know, we can get similar results all over the place. So then where is, what are the limitations on it? You know, that would be one of the first questions I think any rational person would ask. What does this mean? You know, how far does this go? What is it capable of doing? Because, I mean, the stuff that they've described um, in their Chips and Salsa interviews with the insiders is bonkers in terms of the, the amount of control that this thing seems to have over reality. And that's right there. That's ontological shock because that, you know, your ontology is your reality. And so as soon as you go, I, I have to replace this. This doesn't work anymore. I broke the glass and now I've got to, I got to put it back together again. But you got to put it back together again in a way that incorporates what you've experienced. And we don't have enough information for most people to do that. And you end up just coming to a place where you're like, I don't know. And that's where I'm at. I just gave up. I have had so many different experiences that I couldn't explain. And I went through multiple rounds of ontological shock that eventually I got to a point where I'm just like, I don't know, reality is fake. Like, you know, most of the time it's consensus reality. But not always. And when you get into the areas where it's not, you know, consensus reality, there don't seem to be any limits on what can happen. Like literally anything seems to be possible. How do you incorporate that? How do you live a life when you've got the idea that literally anything could happen to you at any moment? Because some weird stuff that you couldn't explain did. And then when you looked into it, you found out that it was a lot more common than you thought. Because that's also what happens to people is they have an experience and then they become obsessed with it. You see this all the time. Somebody will have a UFO sighting 
And then they're completely obsessed with UFOs. They have to learn everything they can about UFOs because they're trying to understand it. They're trying to answer the questions so they don't have to think about them anymore. So they can build this new reality. And you end up with, the more you dig into it, the more questions you get. You don't get, you get some answers, but those answers lead to more questions. And then eventually everybody just kind of, you get into a gray gray area and you're like, I don't know anymore about any of it. Yeah, I uh, got a couple of thoughts there. First of all, this also explains debunkers as well. These passion debunkers that become obsessed with debunking UFOs um, and come to find out with every one of these major debunkers, they've had an experience. One example is Stephen Greenstreet. He's, he, he's got a YouTube video where he, he, you know, he testifies that he absolutely saw a boomerang UFO over Provo, Utah outside. Um, he goes into great detail. It's undeniable. He he's, hasn't changed his story. And yet he just rages against anyone who says that there's any truth to any of this. Um, there's some other people I don't want to ma- name that <laughs> fit in that same category. So some people can go into like really passionate sort of denial w- that's actually rooted in an ontological shock that they had, right? Or protecting them from going into ontological shock. It's like a protection mechanism. Oh, like like prevention. It's it's like it, it's like the dam trying to hold all the water back, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like the brain being like. We've got to just ignore this because it's too challenging and the stress from it is going to be too much to handle. And you yeah. see that an awful lot. Yeah, yeah. The other thing I want to talk about was uh, you keep mentioning uh, consensus reality. And I want to distinguish consensus reality from base reality. And I would consider base reality sort of like um, – objective reality. Some people say there's not an objective reality. And when I, when I hear that, I say, okay, put your hand in a fire or uh, get, get bitten by a, a poisonous snake. We, you know, <laughs> drink poison, a walk off a cliff. Uh, you know, there is absolutely an objective reality out there. You know, if, if a meteor goes through your house and hits you on the head, you're dead. I mean, it, you, you know what I'm saying? So there is this objective reality and I call it base reality. And unfortunately we all have to share that base reality, right? And then on top of that is this social construct that humans have made called consensus reality. And that's things like money, right? I mean, in reality, money is just, it's either numbers in a computer or it's a a colored piece of paper. And we had that consensus reality that, you know, the dollar, US dollar has value, Um, prices on things, consumerism, um, our whole world is driven by this consensus reality and marketing and news and plays into that. And, uh, you know, it props up our societies and our cultures, but that's sort of divorced from absolute objective reality, right? In the real world, people starve. In the real world, people burn. In the real, you know, in the real world, you know, people have joy. There's there's real, real objective reality out there. And then there's this consensus that UFOs are silly. The aliens are imaginary, right? This goes back to Carl Sagan's uh, you know, demon haunted world where he's got, what was it? Invisible pink unicorn in the garage, right? Right? Yeah. And, and I would use that as an example of as consensus reality and not objective reality. The definition I would say of consensus reality is a little broad because some people would, would definitely say what you're describing as base reality. They would call consensus reality. Um, so I guess even poison and fire and gravity. Well, okay. So look at the, look at the stories of saints who can levitate. They're not, you know, they're not, uh, covered by gravity. The law of gravity. No, 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 no. no. That's not what I'm saying. I'm I'm saying that, that that base reality is event based. Listen, if you're in a congregation and the priest starts levitating, right? He floats over the, the church or whatever. That's objective reality. He actually physically, you see what I'm saying? I'm talking about measure, scientific measurements. It's like what they do on the ranch. They have scientific measurements. They got a camera pointed at something and an object moves and splits into multiple objects. That's 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 not consensus reality. Okay. Do you, you, you see what I'm saying? I'm, I, if there's an uh, event and it's measured and it's observed and it's it's in the physical world. you know. If, listen, if you're in an airplane and the engines crap out on you, you're going to crash. 
Now, can you levitate? Can you fly a plane? Yes, you can. But in both cases, that's more objective reality. Than, to me, consensus reality is when we all get in the same room and we agree to something, right? Or we have an election and everybody agrees with the results, right? Whether, whether the results are objectively correct or not, we have this consensus reality. We sort of play along with everybody, right? And that's what people are up against with this whole you know, phenomenon UFOs is once you see one, well, the consensus reality is, is you know, you're just repeating what you've seen in movies, right? Which, by the way, movies are consensus reality, right? You know, E.T., everybody knows E.T., right? Is E.T. real? No. But is he? Yeah, kind of. You, you, can you see the difference between those two in my mind? Yes, but I think most people, if you ask them, they're going to say, well, people can't levitate. That's impossible, you know? And you're saying, well, it's based reality if you have the if you have the evidence of it, you have the proof. But the reason why it's not consensus reality is because there isn't the proof. Or we don't and all agree on is, it. Or we just don't agree on it. Or we just don't agree on it. We just right. don't agree on it. If we don't agree on it, it's not consent. Where our consensus reality is that we don't agree on it. You know, this is that group consciousness. And there's also a group unconsciousness, but underneath it all, you know, fire burns. And yet people can walk on coals. People can. Yes, but that's not, again, that's not. Cons <laughs> so once we all agree that something that we've observed objectively is, is, is true, then it becomes, it becomes a consensus reality as well. Just because it's a consensus reality doesn't mean it's not actually grounded in, you know, if I walk on fire, then objectively that's reality. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that. In my mind, it's event-based. But what That's I'm why saying we do scientific that, experiments. Yes. Right? This is all about science yes. and scientific. You know, science yes. says that there's an objective, measurable world apart from the observer, apart from what scientists actually agree on. Scientists get things wrong all the time. Consensus reality is, is very consistently false, right? There's a lot of lies out there that we all agree to. They say death and taxes are reality. No, just death is. Taxes are optional. And depending on your definition of death, even that may be wrong. And that's where I'm like, you know, when you go through ontological shock, depending on what it is, you can come out on the other side being like, anything's possible. Because you end up experiencing enough things that you were told aren't possible. They're not in consensus reality. And then you experience them. And, you know, fine, it's base reality, but you didn't know it until you experienced it. And so when you, at that point, it's just like, well, the only difference between consensus reality and base reality is what people agree on. That's it. Well, if you find yourself out of the consensus and in the base reality, you're screwed. Unless you can meet up with other people who've had similar or the same experiences and you'll almost never find anybody who else has had the exact same experience you'll find other people who've had similar experiences but people don't want to talk about it because of the shame um and the misunderstanding because again you could people will just be like oh you're you're crazy you're talking about things that are not a part of the reality we all agree on so you must be wrong you've got to be crazy um, you know, I always use Psy as an example when I talk about this. Psy, you know, ESP, because there actually is a tremendous volume of of like peer-reviewed scientific proof of Psy replicated all over the world. You know, some of these experiments, millions of times they've been replicated. Otto Gonsfeld um, as an example. And yet, if you tell somebody that you experienced one of these, they'll either ignore it or they'll think you're mistaken or they'll outright say you're crazy because it's just not accepted. People aren't willing to accept it. Science isn't willing to accept it because it would be scientific ontological shock. In other words, science would have to throw everything out and replace it with something new. And what they'd have to throw out is materialism, the idea that, you know, Everything in the universe is based on physical matter, physical forces. And then what do you replace it with? Now, a lot of the scientists who studied this um, turned into idealists. 
idealism, you know, the universe is rooted in ideas or consciousness um, to the point where they question, wonder whether our thoughts contribute to physical reality. That the reason why we generally all experience these things is because we're all psychically linked together and we're all just kind of in agreement that this is what we're going to experience. The consensus reality is like, yeah, we're fine with this. But you can go out of that. And it's a lot easier to do it when you're by yourself, which is why these experiences are more common to people who are isolated. And then when you get them into groups, the dynamic changes. And I'm not going to get into all of the stuff about psi and the sheep goat effect and whatever, but you can look into it and you will see that there's the dynamic can be dramatically changed by one person who has very, very strong beliefs. Um, typically, you know, the consensus reality, they can pull it back towards that. And that's another reason why it's so isolating. You know, that's such a common thing with ontological shock is this sense of isolation and, and all, uh, being alone. Um, and yeah. that is incredibly difficult for people. You know, the, they, the, who can the, I talk to? And I can't relate to anybody else, you know? Um, and they get very withdrawn and that can be hard to pull out of. Well, the, the loneliness can be absolutely um, overwhelming. Uh, you know, it, it, it absolutely devastating loneliness because you're sort of hanging out there, sort of trying to figure out how to, I wouldn't say once you drop that glass with the water in it, you can put it back together. I think you've got to find another glass and you got to start filling it up again. You know, this is ontological shock. You know, the acronym is OS, right? And the way I see this is it's, a, it's an OS upgrade. It's like when you go from Windows 10 to Windows 11, which no one should do, by the way, it sucks. Um, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? This is, an, this is an operating system, almost upgrade and reboot for people. And that can be very, very isolating. And you can feel like you're the only one and no one really understands what you're going through. And that seems like that's just one of the steps you have to go through. It's the hero's journey where you have to go into that cave in total darkness alone, you know, figure your shit out and then come back out of the cave, a, a different, I would say leveled up or upgraded person. Um, we, we need to talk about where, where the light is at the end of this tunnel. People, when they come out of this, if they do come out of it, they come out stronger, wouldn't you say? More resilient to change perhaps? Often, what, yeah. what are the benefits of ontological? Why would anyone want to go through this this bullshit? Why would anyone want to go through ontological shock? Have that OS upgrade? Isn't it to level up? I would say, yeah. And that another term for that is a spiritually transformative experience, because you come out of the other side of it, it, just like with a totally new perspective. Very often, a spiritual shift as well. Because um, as I said, you can't really end up separating all these things out when you dig into it, when you actually read the research and the science and, and, and also philosophy, it all comes back to that. It always does. It comes back to spirit and consciousness and how consciousness, consciousness is non-local with remote viewing as an example. Um, and then you move from that into astral projection. And you find out that it's not just non-local, like you can take your consciousness somewhere else. The government, you know, spent a lot of time researching that. It was unfortunate that it was also connected with MK Ultra and all the weird conspiracy stuff. But they were really taking it very seriously and they were looking into it um, extensively. And it's because all that stuff was connected together. You know, you just you move from one thing to another. Um. You know, I said I was going to talk a little bit maybe about some of my experiences. I won't go into great detail. One of the first things that happened to me, though, and it was in 2020. And before that happened, I was a hardcore materialist. You know, science had the answers to everything. Science could figure everything out. Um, I very much bought into consensus reality. I was an atheist, open minded on these things. I would say a true skeptic. I, you know, I could be changed. My mind could be changed by getting new evidence, new information, good evidence. Um, but one of the first things that happened was I had an out of body experience. And 
the feeling of it was a hundred percent real. I was not in my body. I'd never experienced anything like it. I tilted up out of my body, and then it was like, oh my god, what the, what is happening? Like I could see around me, like it was up out of my body. I was in bed, and then it was like a rubber band attached to my belly button that pulled me back into my body. And I remember telling all my friends on the phone the next day, I had an out-of-body experience. It was so weird. And I looked into out-of-body experiences and so many people describe it exactly the same way where they would tilt up and out and describing the rubber band attached to the belly button. Are you talking about an umbilical cord? That you could call it that. Um, The term that's frequently used is the silver cord. I don't know if this is a Hindu thing or it's very common in New Age um, astral projection. There's a silver cord. People talk about it with near-death experience that, you know, sometimes when they go back into their body, there's a silver cord that pulls them back into it. So you, that's one of those things. It's like you you start digging into this stuff and it it covers all these different anomalous experience categories. So that was, you know, if I just had that, I could have just gone on and forgotten all about it. But then I started having other experiences. I had a precognitive dream. And then I started having a bunch of synchronicities. And then I did um, remote viewing, kind of semi-unintentionally and then very intentionally. And the results were profound. And all, you know, every time this would happen, I'd be like, okay, wait a second. How do I rationalize this how does this work i was always convinced that there was a scientific explanation that i could figure out and i'm not saying there isn't a scientific explanation for these things but i was like i'm going to figure it out i'm going to be the one to figure it out because there's got to be you know it's got to be a way this works um and then i dug into it and i just ended up with more questions i got answers but i didn't you know i wasn't becoming more confident i was becoming less confident I was like, well, if that can be real, then what else does that mean? Like, if I can go out of my body, where can I go? What can I do with it? You know, what can other people do with it? Can I be pulled out of my body? Turns out you can. And that's a lot of what happens with experiencers and abduction is that they seem to be removing your consciousness from your physical body and taking it wherever rather than taking your whole body. They can do that too, apparently, or at least make you think that's what's happening. So that triggered some ontological shock for me in a major way. And I had to figure out how to incorporate that. And it took me a long time. And I was very cautious to maintain my footing. And this is where we got to be really careful with ontological shock because you can, you can lose your footing and float off into the ether and you can, you can literally enter psychosis and you don't necessarily come back from that. Like you can, this can trigger a genuine psychotic break. Right, at least temporarily, right? I mean, it can, that can... Y- yes, or not, permanently. Not really permanently could, as well? It, yeah, not as common, but it could be, yeah. See, um, what... But then you start questioning, well, yeah, but did they have a genuine experience or were they, were they schizophrenic and it was an onset of that? Well, we don't know. We don't have the answers to those questions yet. You know, the thing is here, this conversation itself can, can sort of like raise the visceral feeling that I have of ontological shock coming, just having this conversation. And the reason why is because you don't feel in control. This isn't something you decided to do, Charles. You didn't wake up one morning and say, I want to lose my shit over this, or I want to have this bizarre experience that I can't, I can't explain or understand or cope with. We're not in control of it. So as part of our life story in our personal journeys, what's the purpose? And, and, If we're not in control, what is in control? Is it a higher power? Is it a higher force? Or is it just grays somewhere pushing some buttons with their three fingers? And are the grays connected to a higher force? Are they the higher force? Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. You know, and, and again, it's like, well, I don't know. And I would say that in terms of, you know, a, a helpful grounding technique, one of the, most basic ones, what you don't really see out there is learning how to say, I don't know, and being okay and comfortable with going, I don't have the answers to this and I'm not going to get them. Because when you try and fill in the blanks, that's when things start to get really hard. 
because you start trying to make rules for things that you're you're getting the rules wrong and then you're trying to hammer what you're experiencing into this fake reality that you're making up as you go and it's not going to work and it's just going to be frustrating and you're going to constantly be stressed out trying to figure out how to put all these things together and keep you know keep all these plates spinning um and so it's been really helpful for me to be able to get to a place where I just go, I don't know. I just don't know. I mean, I've got some ideas, but they're just, it's a hypothesis. You know, I'm probably not going to come to any conclusions in this life on this stuff, not on the big ideas. So I like that advice. You're basically saying, you know, you're, you you sort of feel like you're starting to lose control of, of, what's happening in your life. Maybe you feel like you're losing control of your mind, maybe your body. You just start losing control of everything. And so you start dealing with this like a clenched fist. And you're saying, just say, you know, it's okay for me not to have the answer, not to know this. Just sort of embrace the mystery and let it be a mystery and just sort of release your hand, right? And let the butterfly go, right? So that's that's one grounding technique is to just say, it's okay, I, I don't know. What are some other grounding techniques? Um, well, there are some very practical ones. Like if you're if you're feeling tremendous anxiety, there's one where you use all of your senses to help, you know, bring you back into a physical state. So you'll look around your room and you'll try and find everything that's the same color. You know, look and try and find everything that's red, for example. Um, smell. What do you smell in the air right now? Um, take a piece of fabric or a texture and feel it in your fingers listen to all the sounds you hear in your environment and identify each of them so these kinds of things are, are intended to bring you back from like a feeling of derealization or depersonalization so derealization is commonly associated with a high uh high state of anxiety or trauma and it's where you feel like things aren't real not just reality but your specific experience you start to feel like you know it's kind of like you're high or you're on drugs but you're not you're sober but you you're just like whoa things don't feel real right now and depersonalization is a sense of like you're not really you and if you've ever experienced this where you kind of like you can even be out, feel like you're outside of your body, kind of observing things as a separate person. And that can come from an intense state of, you know, anxiety. It's like a defense mechanism. Both of these things are a defense mechanism of the brain, but they can, you know, make things worse. So you want to try and bring yourself back to, you know, into your body. And that's what using all of your senses can help you do that. Um, there's another technique that some people use literally grounding take your shoes off and go outside and put your feet in the grass or in the dirt and just try and visually connect yourself visualize connecting yourself to the ground um and some people you know they'll imagine pulling up energy from the ground and, and you don't have to do that if you don't want but if you think it's helpful you can do that too these visualization techniques can be helpful so that's another technique. Um, don't isolate yourself. So get around other people and talk about consensus reality stuff. Like it's it's great if you can get a group of people where you can talk about these out of the world ideas or you know transrational concepts. But you also need to be able to participate in consensus reality too. So you need to put yourself out there. Uh, this morning I I went to a class at the library specifically just to get out and be around other people um, and not be in my head pondering all the stuff that I'm I'm wondering about lately. So that's another technique. You got any any personal ones, Dean? Because yes, I, I do actually. Yes, I have I have a really good one that um that I just discovered recently. It's called nature bathing. I'm not sure if you've heard of that term before, but definitely go online. I'm gonna add some kind of a link at the bottom. I just discovered this in the last month. It's called nature bathing and there's a book about it. And it's exactly what you described for the most part, 
where you, you you physically touch the grass. You basically go into nature. Get out of the city if you can, or go to a park. Get somewhere where there's green grass. You know, there's a lot of nature and wildlife to some degree, even though it's birds and ducks or whatever. And you basically bathe yourself in those different um, senses. You know, you start listening to everything you can hear and try to hear the farthest thing and identify it and try to identify the things that are closer that you can hear. Just sit still and try to see motion and just look at things that are moving and, and sort of ignore the things that are not moving. The reason I, the, how I learned this was actually here locally, there's a, there's a garden and they actually have a guy there that you can hire and he'll just take you on this little uh, nature bathing course that takes about an hour and then you, you drink some tea at the end. And uh, it, it's changed my life. I don't even walk around the neighborhood anymore. I don't even go in my own backyard and and smell it, see it, you know, hear it, feel it. Um, you know, I mow the lawn. I take my shoes off now when I mow the lawn. Why not? So what if they turn green, right, <laughs> from the grass? Um, so nature bathing is is something that I highly recommend for everyone, and it's free. It doesn't cost a thing other than your time. Uh, my advice is, though, don't have your phone with you. A lot of people out there now are walking around and they're just on their phones the whole time with headphones on and they're tripping over dog poop on the trail because they're not even paying attention, you know? So that's, that's one I've, I've learned recently. Yet I think the phone thing, um, a lot of people use distraction as a technique, um, to de-stress, you know, you don't, you don't even, you take yourself out of the world around you by distracting yourself with TV or, you know, even reading books or whatever, um, or staring at your phone, surfing Reddit, doom scrolling. Um, and all of those things are keeping you from participating in the real world. So you want to try and, and, you know, they can be helpful techniques in terms of dealing with anxiety, but you don't want to get out of control. Um, another thing you really want to avoid is is using intoxicating substances like, you know, pot or alcohol or you know name your favorite pill um because especially if you're dealing with you know ontological shock that is only going to make things worse and it can very easily turn into substance abuse because then you're like this is the only way that i can cope i'm just going to continue to do this over and over again and so people end up you know heavy drinkers or you know smoking pot 15 times a day. Um, Would you put caffeine in that category of self-medication? I Yeah, yeah I would. Um, I quit caffeine. Well, I'm in the process of quitting caffeine. Uh, I'm currently trying to cut out all of that kind of stuff. But that's part of my spiritual journey more than ontological shock. But it does help, you know? So I think if you can do it, do that, but you don't want to do, you don't want to like destroy your routine all at the same time and just make things more stressful. So like, don't overdo it, but all of the practical advice that people give for reducing stress, same thing with ontological shock, you know, get plenty of sleep, um, you know, stay on top of chores and, and, you know, do manual like exercise or physical labor um, is really healthy and helpful. So all those kind of stress reduction techniques, take a bath if you want, or a shower or something. Those are good too. I Again, I do think it's helpful to talk to other people who've had similar experiences, but only up to a point because you can completely separate yourself from consensus reality and totally get involved with people who are, you know, out of that state. And it can make things much worse because all you're taking in is more of the stuff that's challenging your belief system all the time. Because as I said, like there really isn't a good model. Like when you break that glass, there isn't, you can't just buy another glass to replace it. There isn't one. Like you can throw out materialism and you can say, I'm replacing it with idealism. But then it's like, well, you, th at that point you're saying I can turn anything into a glass. In other words, there's no rules or restrictions on it. And you can you can get even worse losing touch with the reality if you do that. So in, in other words, if you're like in a support group or whatever, 
And all you're hearing all day long is people who are like, I had an experience and it challenged me in this way. And I had an experience and it was this and it was this. You're just constantly going to be like, what does that mean? How does that work? What would that mean for me? You know, what if I experience that? What if I do experience that? How can I experience that? What if I don't experience that? And you can lose it. So again, everything kind of in moderation is is really the key on this. What advice would you give uh, to family and loved ones of someone that is unwittingly, un- undesirably experiencing ontological shock? What's How can they help the best? Don't deny what they're experiencing because typically these things are all subjective experience. And you can't deny somebody else's subjective experience. You know, it's not a matter of not of you shouldn't, you can't. That's like if somebody says I'm depressed, you can't say, no, you're not, you're not depressed. It's the same thing. If somebody says I experienced this thing that only I experienced, there's no proof of it. It's a subjective experience at that point. You know, if you argue with them about it, they're just gonna feel more isolated and alone and unsupported. Um, Ask questions to try and get a better understanding of it and encourage the person to do the healthy things, you know, maybe do it with them, say, hey, we should take a walk every day or, you know, listen to music together, Um, creative activities, painting, playing music, things like that. Um, You know, doing things together with the person who's struggling can be very helpful. Try and encourage them to get some mental health support if you think they need it. But try not to be judgmental, because as you pointed out earlier, people don't pick and choose to have this happen generally. The people who do, by you know taking psychedelics or whatever, feel more in control of it. And it's much easier for them to deal with it than the people who were just like, I didn't want any of this, and it started happening, and now I gotta now I gotta figure it out. And there's no rules, and you know, nobody has the answers. Or there are people who claim to have the answers, but then there's 500 people who claim to have the answers and none of them are in agreement. So then what do you do with that? What advice would you give to people who have not experienced ontological shock? Maybe they're concerned or they feel like it might be coming because of what they're learning. Well, you know, there's many people that are seekers. They just want to know and they want to learn and they feel drawn to this, like a moth to a flame. I'm talking about the phenomenon itself. Not They're not looking for ontological shock. They're just, they get a lot of thrill and joy learning all this. And then the ontological shock may just sneak up on them one day, right? They just watch the f- season finale of Skinwalker Ranch and suddenly it's there. When up until then, it was just this entertaining thing that they were, you know, sort of enjoying in their lives. What advice would you give to the people that are listening to this now that haven't experienced ontological shock? What can they do to prepare for it? Not prevent it. Right. Not prevent it. You can't prevent this. How do you prepare for it? Or can you prepare for a future ontological shock? I think the best way to prepare is just to know how to deal with it if it happens. But I I would say the best piece of advice that I have for anybody is whatever, when you're researching these things, which people inevitably do, they go looking for answers because that's, you know, that seems like the only way out is finding answers to these things. Um, I encourage people to take the answers, but hold them loosely. In other words, you know, again, that idea of saying, I don't know, like, I think it could be this, this seems like this kind of makes sense, but be willing to let it go. If it turns out, it doesn't fit. When you see people who like, um, join a cult, for example, they're looking for answers. And they go, they find somebody who's like, I have the answers. I'll give you the answers. And you buy into that. It, it, that it tends to end in disaster because that person doesn't have all the answers. They're not the, you know, the embodiment of God. They're not the ultimate guru, most likely. They may have some answers, but they tend to claim they have all the answers. And that's where things go really awry. So don't do that to yourself either. Don't t- don't become your own guru and tell yourself, I have the answer to everything. Um, and that can be a sign of psychosis, you know, because you 
you see that, people will be like, I am God. I know everything. I see everything. I have all the rules. I understand it all. Um, yeah, probably there's a lot not. Of... You know, that that is likely to lead to a collapse when they find out that that's not the case. Yeah, there's a lot of that on YouTube, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Just uh, just search for solipsism on YouTube and you find a lot of people that have figured out their God. And it's um, and then you see them, you look at them like six, nine months later and they've imploded and they're, and they're crying and asking their, their audience to help them figure, figure their shit out. Yeah. And, um, and I don't want to say, by the way, there's the idea that we're all like connected to God or, or we're the, you know, we're an embodiment of God or something like that. Those things are not the same. You can, you can have one and not the other. You can feel, you can have a divine sense within yourself without feeling like you have all the answers. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. Or worse, solipsism where you think you're making it all happen. Yes. Yeah. That was something that I, I explored heavily. Um, because you get into this, you know, one of the things you come across is the power of positive thinking, you know, over and over again, people are like, if you just have positive thoughts, you're going to have positive outcomes. Well, pretty quickly you look at that and you're like, I, don't think so like more people would be having you know amazing perfect lives if that was the case at least some people would but you talk to even you know the wealthiest people and they're like man my life is crap you know i'm stressed about this i hate this whatever what's the point why why is our mortal experience um having to face this well why is this part of what it is to be a human being this whole ontological shock thing. Uh, it seems like it's sort of a natural thing. I'm compelled to believe that it's its really uh, something within us, you know, our, our our true self, our higher self, our center self, our long self, whatever you want to call that, wanting to grow and heal. At the end of the day, I think this ontological shock, once you go out long-term, it's a healing process. Because you're actually getting closer to some kind of a, a of a truth, right? That's, that's that's if you don't go off the rails. I'm I'm talking about someone who successfully has an incredible ontological shock and figures it out. A, a good example of that is Chris Bledsoe. You know, I've read his book, um, UFO of God, and I'll tell you, this guy's pretty grounded right now. He says all the time, "I don't know what's going on. I don't know," and then he can point above his tree and an orb appears, and it's you know. It seems like that's what this is all about. It's for our, our, our spiritual growth in the long term. Although in the short term, it's in, it's incredibly lonely and painful. To me, this is part of the hero's journey. What do you think about that? Well, so we're just going strictly into the philosophical part of the conversation. Uh, uh, yeah, and I'm right talking now, long term. I'm, I'm talking to, yeah. you know, where do you see yourself in five years? Because of your ontological shock. In a better place or worse place? And is that what this was about? getting into that place long-term? So far, it's been in a better direction. Absolutely. 100%. Um, and I think five years from now, I will be in a better place. That's my hope. And from a philosophical perspective, you know, what is the purpose of this? I think when you look at contact experiences, you know, they happen on an individual level. Right. We don't we're not having the Phoenix lights happen every weekend where thousands of people are seeing a UFO. But people are having individual experiences, incredibly meaningful, spiritually transformative experiences individually a lot. And it seems like that is an opportunity that is given to us to encourage us to grow and change in a positive way seems like it very often happens to people who are struggling. Chris Bloodsoe said he felt like he was at the end of his life, like he was going to die. He was he was ready to give up. And that's very often when these kinds of things happen. And I wasn't to that state, but I was kind of there. You know, I'd been struggling with depression for many, many years. I've been diagnosed with 
CPTSD and severe anxiety and, you know, chronic depression and everything else. And I had all these kind of what at first seemed like random woo experiences. And then over time, they kind of got a theme. And it has turned out to be incredibly positive. Like it's it's put my life in a new positive direction, like taking control in a way that I had I'd given up kind of control of my life a long time ago. And I see that happen a lot. So I think that might be part of it but i don't know you know here i go i say it again i don't know you hear that a lot from me um because i don't want to i'm not the guru i and i tend to hold back on, on what i think could be answers to things i tend to throw out little bits of information and let people figure it out for themselves because everybody's answer is going to be different but i think the reality that there is something greater than the consensus reality. I think that base reality is there. And I think most people can experience it if they want to. Um, I mean, the simplest way is probably just take some DMT or, you know, eat some shrooms or something. That's one way to do it. You can also meditate. That takes a lot longer, typically. You can do CE5. That often seems to work for people. And when they see those lights up in the sky, that tends to be, that can trigger ontological shock because they, the lights didn't just show up. These people thought them into existence. And that's when it's like, what the hell? So you can do that. I'm hesitant to recommend people do CE5 because honestly, we don't know what it is that we're kind of summoning when we do that. Um, and, you know, we had Shannon DeSalvo on and she said she, did this thing with Chris Bloodsoe where he summoned orbs for her and she saw them, but she said she sees them all the time now. That's the thing. Like you could do this and you can't undo these things. Like you do this and that's where you're at from then on. You can't typically just wipe your memory clean. You can become the hardcore debunker um, and attack and ridicule all of this, but that, that's not really effective. And that's why these people tend to be super angry, I think because it doesn't work. You have to keep doing it. So that's what I think is going on with these. They, they're they encouraging people to see that there's something more out there. But wh who knows why? I don't know what's doing it. Like, are there, if aliens do it, I understand it if spirits do it, right? Because we're all spiritual beings and we would theoretically be helping each other if we could. But what about aliens? Why would they be doing it? But they kind of seem to be involved too, maybe. And that's why earlier I was like, maybe they're connected to higher beings or whatever. Again, when you dig into this stuff, it kind of, it's all connected, it seems. Yeah, yeah. In, in an interview that uh, Chris Bledsoe just did earlier this week, and I'll, I'll remember to put a link down at the bottom here. Um, he did another interview and Shannon DeSalvo was again, part of that podcast, as well as a lady that's in Spain, and a guy that's back east, I think in Virginia, there were like four or five people on the podcast and they were describing uh, sort of an experiment that they did with Chris where they they called the person in Spain and Shannon DeSalva was there, you know, three or four people on a phone call, right? In real time, Chris says, go out in your backyards and look up in the sky. And he has, he, he steps them through a certain process you go through of meditation and grounding, bombing yourself, you know, set your intent and he said okay they're they're gonna they're gonna appear and sure enough all of them at the same time saw orbs appear sizes of basketball moving around close to them over their house over their neighbor's house through a tree you know this is undeniable orb situation here um sort of on demand but also they weren't in control of it Th there's clearly a a a, a a separate intelligence that's involved in manifesting. Does that make sense? They're not manifesting the orbs. They're opening themselves up so that whatever is really behind it can manifest. They, they sense the presence of another entity and intelligence when these appear. And what's fascinating is they, they say that when they appear, it's exactly where they were looking. So if they were looking far to the right or far to the left or straight up, wherever they were looking, 
at the moment Chris said, okay, here they are, they appeared in the center of their vision. So those orbs knew where they were looking. And, you know, they're calling it some kind of a, a quantum entanglement where you've got all these different time zones, someone on the other side of the, uh, the globe, and they all see the same thing within within a second of each other. They all saw orbs. Um so that's, I think that gives us a little hint about what's really going on here. Do you sense that, that this is not, you're, you're not making this up, but there's actually a third party entity that's aware of what's going on and sort of driving what you're experiencing? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I realize that for people who haven't had these experiences, they hear this and they're just like, ah, they, they, they must be wrong. Or they you know, made it up. They've they're making a, it up. Yeah, they're making it up or they're just confused. They're not thinking it through. I didn't come to this conclusion easily. You know, I didn't just read some articles or read a couple books and go, wow, that that must be the, the nature of reality right there. It's totally different than I thought. Golly. Um, it was it was due to my firsthand experiences coupled with my research. And when I researched it, I looked for you know, science first. I looked for published peer-reviewed papers um, before I went to anecdotal accounts. Those, you know, were the last on the list in terms of what I valued. But my own firsthand experience, I questioned it. And, you know, I, I've been talking in very abstract terms because I don't know whether to really dive into my experience or not, some of it. Um, but I think it perfectly encapsulates how people end up in ontological shock. Are you think I should go there or do you think I should save it for another time? I'm how leaving do you feel? it up to you. I'm Me? fine with talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, this is, I'm interviewing you today. So, okay. Go for it. All you, right. You know, people can tune out. They can always just unlink and subscribe and, you know. So I, and I'm not going to go into great detail on some of this, um, but as I mentioned, you know, I had this out-of-body experience. I had a precognitive dream that came true literally the next day. Um, then I was having all these synchronicities. I created my Reddit account to do a tarot reading. I wanted to try doing tarot readings for people and see how accurate they were. Um, the first reading that I did for a person it was fine. But then I was like, do you mind if I try doing remote viewing? I just had this kind of urge to do it. I sort of knew what remote viewing was because I'd read Dean Radin's book. And this guy was like, yeah, I've heard of that. Sure. And so I tried to describe his bedroom, like from where the perspective I was seeing things. And I laid out the whole room. You know, there's a bookcase here. There's a desk. You're on a low bed near the floor. There's an animal on the bed next to you. There's some art hanging up and it looks like this. And by the end of it, I had given this whole explanation, and it turned out every single thing that I described was right. Every single piece of it, even down to the animal being on the, the bed next to him, which was on cinder blocks. It was low to the floor. And I was like, okay, I don't know what to make of that. Like, it was probably a coincidence, right? So I was like, well, how would I figure that out? So I thought of every bedroom I've ever known. You know, mine, my friends, whatever. And I wrote down like all of the features of those. And then I tried to match it up. How many of them matched up with what I described? And it didn't come anywhere close to 100%. So I was like, there might be something to this. And so I looked up, how do you do remote viewing? And I tried it. And I went through just even only a handful of the training sessions. And consistently, I got results that were far outside of the bounds of chance. And I did the same kind of thing where I was like, all right. What if I picked another random object? How many of the things that I wrote down would describe that object? And it was never as close as the actual target. So I really was trying to like, like disprove this stuff. I was trying to debunk it for myself. But the more I was trying these things, the more they were getting confirmed. And while I was exploring all of that, you know, all this stuff came up about, you know, the thing that I saw when I was a kid, when I was six in a cornfield that I had always called a giant grasshopper was maybe a mantis being. I didn't even know what a mantis being was. So that was a whole other thing was this kind of alien abduction stuff. And it was a, it was a side path. That wasn't even like the main journey. I kind of explored that and went, 
there might be something there. I don't know. Kind of went back onto the main path, which led me into trying EVP, um, electronic voice phenomenon, where you contact spirits. That's the theory. Because I'm good with, you know, electronics and gadgets and, and stuff. And I love doing experiments. You know, I'm always building things and, um, and I've got my ham radio license. I'm that kind of nerd. So I was like, this sounds like something fun to try. And there were some tutorials online and I tried it. And immediately within 20 minutes, I got something that sounded like it was responding to my question. I was like, mm. probably just hearing what I want to hear, right? Because I knew pareidolia was a thing. Well, God, I could talk about this for like five hours, but I will just jump ahead a bit. So the more I was doing this, the more the more it was becoming a reality to me that I was communicating with something that claimed to be spirits, multiple spirits. Um, they had names, they had identities. They were giving me over and over again, vertical information. One of the first things I did was an experiment with another EVP practitioner where we each wrote down a word on a piece of paper and we're like, you know, I'm going to, here's the word I'm giving it to my spirits to give to her spirits so she can get it. And it worked. The experiment worked. And I even recorded, like I had the thought in my head, I was thinking of the word and it showed up in my own recording very clearly. And that was one of the things that happened. And so I was like, oh my God, I, you know, obviously I went through ontological shock with that. Something is, re you know, I don't know if they're spirits. I don't know what they are. How could I know? But there's a consciousness that's out there that claims to be this. And it can do these things. And it's not limited by space or time. And it's there whenever I sit down. That was one of the other things. Because the method I was using, this transform EVP methodology, um, it's not like where you just sit around and you're like, you got the radio flipping channels and you're kind of waiting for bursts of static that sort of sound like something. I was getting 30 minutes at a time in a session. It was pretty much limited by my being like, I can't do this anymore because it would make me really tired to do this. Um, but I would sit down, I'd record 30 minutes of stuff and I'd get 30 minutes of my asking questions and getting responses. Now, I could only understand about 40% of it, which was maddening to me. Like I wanted to get more of it. I wanted to be able to understand all of it. And I was always tweaking and changing and blah, blah, blah. And I was getting different results, but I was not getting better results necessarily. Um, turned out when I did more research after, you know, my own experiments learning about it, I found out that that is actually very typical, that even the best EVP people never really got much better than about 50% most of the time. And it seemed like it's intentional. Like they have control over it. And I even recorded this in one of the sessions that I did. One of the first things I got, it came through very loud and clear. And it was my dad's voice saying, you know, hello, this is Gordon, which was his name. But then right after that, this voice said, I need you to make it slighter. And then everything after that was like quieter. <laughs> like it was easier to rationalize it away. And this... And I've talked about this before. Seems to be a key with these phenomena is that you experience them in a way where you can ignore it if you choose to. And other people can ignore it if they choose to. It's like they're pro protecting consensus reality. They're like giving you the experience if you want to have it. Um, but it's going to be really hard for you to share it with other people. It's not for them. It's for you. And I was told that by the spirits over and over again. They're like, we're not here to help you talk to ghosts or, you know, dead celebrities or whatever we're here to help you with your spiritual development but while i was doing this one of the spirits that came through i got a name um and it had a distinct accent are you comfortable with my talking about this right now i won't go i won't give the name unless you're okay with it no don't don't say the name i won't say the name but it was one of your good friends who yes, had who, passed a year before. Who had That's died the, under mysterious circumstances. Yes. And this spirit um, 
you you heard some of the recordings and you you again you were like i can't hear this clearly but you were like i recognize the accent right not only the accent but what he said <laughs> yeah yeah because it's exactly so, what he would have said yeah and he told me what his what his manner of death was and it was kind of a shock to both of us but it sort of made sense um and that was when i was like holy crap this is i can't deny this anymore like the rest of it i was like maybe i'm using side i'm tapping into things and blah 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 i didn't know who this person was i'd never heard of them I had no idea they existed but you were the one who was like well i think i know who that might be and it was and it was him and he gave us his name right and so he just to back up here first of all first thing i want to say is you've shared a lot of this with me you've shared a lot of your recordings and i have really really struggled hearing intelligible words i can hear that it sounds like there's some talking going on but i don't connect with it but with right. this particular one with this particular person it was it was undeniable for me what i heard and he had died under mysterious circumstances and he he came out and told you he was murdered he did yeah. and since then just in the last month i've learned additional details about about the the time and you know what happened surrounding his death and he was actually murdered and i think he taught this is emotional i think he actually came to you so that i would look into it he wanted me to know that he was murdered and if you hadn't told me that there's no way i would have even looked into it and that's my ontological shock and part of that was how we ended up getting connected together and when I ended up asking them, the spirits, you know, did you have any part in this? You know, they're like, oh, yeah, we coordinate that kind of stuff all the time um, to achieve whatever goals they're trying to achieve. Don't ask me. Like, well, I'm, I, I'm not here to give the answers to the meaning of life, but that, you know, they do. They have the ability to change. It seems like to change probabilities. Like, it can't be something impossible, but they can. They can make improbable things more probable um, and do, and they're more likely to do it if you ask them. They will help you with things. And my life, you know, one of the reasons I think things have started to turn around is this realization that, A, you know, when I die, <laughs> there's something after that and that I shouldn't throw my life away. Like, I, it has significance and meaning and there's probably some reasons why i'm here and this seemed to be one of them like this connection that we got together i think is part of that and i don't think it's done yet i don't think it was just a matter of you learning about his death i think there's more coming no it, it, there's a lot more coming it, it gets it gets pretty deep um of all the people i've ever met in my entire life this this man uh, that was murdered, that, that communicated with you. I mean, we, we got vertical information that we did not have. We received information that we were able to vertically verify, right? Yes. Um, and if, if anyone I've ever met in my life, this man was the one that would be able to figure out a way to communicate after his death to me. And I never thought, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't looking for this. Did I ask you to do this? No. Uh, this no. just came out of the blue. And and I find out now that a lot of that stuff, I mean, it was, yeah, it's, 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 for me, it's a little bit of ontological shock. It's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking the glass with the water, but I haven't dropped it yet. Yeah. You've just got to let it go. And, you know, you can't get tight. Like, let's just go through your steps. Right. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, at the end of the day, it's it's a mystery. You know, people ask me, how do you explain? I go, you know, I can't explain it. It's a mystery, but it's not made up. It's not imaginary. There's no way we would have that information. Now, what you said about you're not being able to hear most of the stuff that I got, that was one of the things that was driving me off the off the rails, was that I was sharing these recordings with other people and most of the time they weren't hearing what i was hearing and so i was like well then it's probably pareidolia like it's it's my brain is making sense out of things that aren't real 
That's got to be the answer, right? Because nobody else can hear this. Occasionally they could. Um, and so I spent an inordinate amount of time testing all these things, doing calculations. Like, you know, what are the, if you have this many phenomes, you've got 44 phenomes in the English language. And, you know, if you've got a, a the average word is, three phenomes and then you've got a sentence and it's this long what are the odds of random sounds you know blah 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 you go through all that rapidly you're like the odds of random sounds being sentences is incredibly low it's not that it's not random sounds that just happen to go together it's the way the brain is interpreting it and so i was like well then i'm probably losing it i'm losing my mind right but here's the thing. It's like EVP has a bad rap because people are like, I, nobody else can hear these things, but the practitioners can hear them. But most of the time, other people can't hear it. Well, the same people who accept that mediumship is real will, will balk at EVP. But with mediumship, what's happening is the communication is coming direct into your consciousness. Well, it's kind of the same thing with the EVP. It's just there's another layer there which is doing these recordings, but there's still that energetic connection apparently between the practitioner and the spirit. So it's much more likely that the practitioner is going to be able to hear what is coming through. And this isn't my own theory, by the way, this is, there was a tremendous amount of research that was going on with EVP back in the, in the sixties and seventies and even up to the eighties. Um, and they kind of confirmed all this stuff. You know, so other people, scientists and researchers already figured this out for me. But I had to kind of figure it out for myself to make sure that I wasn't going crazy. But then what ends up happening is you do the sessions for long enough. And all of a sudden, instead of just hearing the voices when you're doing the session, you start hearing the voices in ambient sounds. Because with the transform EVP methodology, you're using a noise source that the spirits modulate, or I say spirits, whatever it is, modulates that signal to make it into speech. That seems to be much easier for them than just, you know, creating it out of nothing for whatever reason. So if you've got something that kind of sounds, has some characteristics of speech, they'll modulate that as well. And so that started happening to me and I started hearing it and I was like, well, wait, no, that's a trick of the mind too, right? That is pareidolia. And so I made a recording of one of these things. It was my shop vacuum and I ran it through the software that I use, which removes background noise from speech. That's what it, it's intended to do. So it removed the sound of the vacuum and left behind speech. Well, it was an entire conversation. It's not easy to hear, but it's definitely voices, right? If you, and people who listen to it, I put it up on YouTube. A number of people were like, I can hear parts of that very clearly. And I was like, yeah, but you're hearing part of an entire conversation and the whole conversation makes sense. And there's context, not only within the conversation, but outside of it with the whole picture of what I, <laughs> what's been communicated to me through the EVP. And I was like, I got to take a break. This is too much. I got to stop doing EVP for a while. And then I started getting communication at one point from what the other spirits called demons. And they behaved like demons. And they were encouraging me to kill myself. And now see, now I'm telling this conversation, I'm starting to sound like somebody who's got psychosis and is delusional. Yeah, I realize that. Yeah, you're listening to your shop vac have a conversation. Exactly. That's a right. red flag right there. Because you can't turn that off. When you're doing uh, EVP with your thing, you can turn off your electronics. Yeah, I, can, but I can walk away. But yeah. I mean, if you can hear, if you can hear, you know, a furnace or, you know, you fart and you can hear somebody talking, that's a red and flag. People with schizophrenia ex describe this type of experience all the time. People who are diagnosed with schizophrenia, it now, doesn't necessarily mean they have it, right? Now, now you talk to your therapist about this. This is an important point. So I have a therapist that I was seeing since like 2019 or earlier, maybe. Um, she was seeing me before any of my woo experiences started. So she knows me incredibly well. You know, I see her once or twice a week through the pandemic, the whole thing. It was by, you know, remote. Um, she's been with me through all of these experiences, including this. And of course I went in there and I was like, I, I need to be evaluated. I think I'm, I think I'm losing it. 
And, you know, of course, she's understandably concerned. We did all the talking about all of this. And her conclusion is that she can't obviously confirm what's happening, but she's open to it. She thinks there may be something to it based on the history of how this all unfolded. The fact that I did get veridical information. I did a session for her, tried to get in touch with her father. Um, what? Or her grandfather. Yeah. Um, I got answers, but she was like, I don't really know what those are. I don't know what that means. One of the first things that was in that recording was don't do a session for her. She's not going to be able to hear it. Like the spirit straight up told me other people can't aren't going to hear this stuff because that's not the purpose. It's for me. Right. So I started hearing it maybe it sounds and I was like, OK, uh, this comes and goes. I guess I just this makes sense. Right. If they can modulate when I'm doing a recording, they can modulate anything if they choose to. But I've now I've had contact with something that claims to be demons and acts you know, nasty and evil. It even told me it had messages from Lucifer. And I'm like, I don't even believe him. Like, I don't know what that means. Um, I had to research Lucifer. I was like, I thought Lucifer was the devil. And he's not really. It's a whole other topic. But anyway, they were telling me stuff that I didn't know anything about. Um, and I had to research it and look into it. But I was like, I'm not buying into any of that. I want nothing to do with that. So I was trying to ignore it. Well, eventually, what started happening is I started getting clear audience. In other words, I'm hearing voices in my mind. It doesn't sound like a hallucination. It's internal. And, you know, it's not clear. I can't usually understand what's being said. But again, I've been given veridical information. So I've got some, I have a variety of weird health issues. Um, I started having... Like my heart was racing. I was having serious palpitations. I was trying to decide whether I needed to go to the ER, like what was going on. And these voices were like, you need to take potassium. You need to drink water right now and take potassium. And I was like, why would I, I don't even, I don't think I have any potassium. Like, what would, what would I, what do I do? Um, turned out I did have some potassium. It was, uh, it's a salt substitute was primarily potassium. And I'd, so I mixed up a glass of water with potassium in it and I drank it. It's an electrolyte as it turns out. And it solved the issues. Well, consciously, I didn't know any of that. Now, was it in my subconscious? Sure. I'm sure I read that at some point somewhere, but I heard this through Claire audience and, you know, did it save my life? I don't know. I don't know what would have happened. But I've gotten information, other information that like that a lot, veridical information. Um, they've told me things I wouldn't have known. They've told me things about my friends, stuff like that, that they've confirmed. And so you can see how I've had to go through ontological shock and I'm still kind of dealing with it because I'm like, I don't, this could at any moment, this could turn bad. Like I have voices in my head that I can't turn off. I could theoretically go on medication but I don't have any other signs of psychosis. Um, there's a backstory that explains how all of this came about in the first place. And it's not negatively affecting my life. As a matter of fact, it's been very positive. So my therapist is like, I, you know, don't think you, you could try it if you want, but I don't think you need it. But what happens if these voices become negative? What happens if I start hearing voices in my head telling me lies or, you know, to do this or that or whatever? Um, I mean, I had spirits tell me to drink water with potassium in it and I did it. I've gotten to the point where voices are telling me what to do and I'm following their instructions. That's, that sounds like a red flag, doesn't it? But I'm fully aware of how crazy all of this sounds, how ridiculous and unbelievable it all sounds, but I'm not the only one to experience it. And again, when you look at the research of EVP, people who do EVP long enough, this is very, very common. They start hearing it in ambient sounds and then they start hearing it as clear audience. It's like you're, it's a part of your brain. It's like working anything else. If, you know, if you play the piano, you get better at it. You know, you shoot basketball, you get better at it. Any skill, if you use it, you develop it. If I'm communicating with spirits often enough, I develop it. And that seemed to be what happened. Um, now, I quit doing EVP because I was like, I don't understand what's happening. I need to be careful. Like, 
always be careful with things if you don't know what they are. Um, and it's like decreasing. It's becoming less. And I have no doubt that if I, you know, fired up the computer and started doing all this again, it would it would increase again. Um, it's possible that they're pulling back and kind of giving me a break because they're seeing that I'm like, whoa, I got to slow this down. Um, and they do confirm and say all of these things. Like I say them like questions. Maybe it's this, but they've told me these things, but I'm just not willing to just accept it. Right. I said, take these things and hold them lightly. And that's what I've been doing all along. And that's how I am keeping my footing. That's how I'm staying grounded is by just being like, this is a giant question mark. <laughs> I don't know what this means. I don't know what is happening. Um, I sure hope it doesn't turn into psychosis, but it isn't right now. And so far it's been, you know, 90% positive and amazing, but I'm not allowed to share it with anyone else. Apparently I can throw sound clips up and some people can kind of hear it and I'm happy to include that or link to it or whatever. Um, some of the sessions I've done. And you'll hear some of it, but a lot of it, you'll be like, I can't really hear that. There's another thing, which is the cocktail party effect. So, you know, if you go to a cocktail party and there's all these people talking at once, you tune into one conversation out of the whole room. Now, that's a skill that anybody can develop. You practice at it, you get better at it. If you've ever worked at a bartender in a bar where it's loud, you know that you, you know, you got better over time at being able to hear what people are saying. You can tune in on that and that's part of the evp is you practice hearing things that are hard to hear voices that are hard to hear and you develop that and the last thing i want to say about that is in relation to pareidolia you know that's the common explanation that's the debunk is people say it's all pareidolia pareidolia is simply the brain pattern matching to human features you know faces or silhouettes um, would be visual pareidolia. You see a face in a burrito, you say that's visual pareidolia because you don't expect to see a face in a burrito. You hear spirits in a recording, that's auditory pareidolia because you wouldn't expect to hear human voices in a recording. But even though it's pareidolia, it's also legitimate. You know, you wouldn't expect to hear human voices there because as far as we know, there are any humans involved, but that doesn't mean that those aren't actually legitimate communications of some type. There's also visual ITC, instrumental transcommunication, where people will get images that come through. Um, I played around with that. I couldn't really get anything. You're talking about on I'm, a TV, right? Like a That's one a, way of doing it. Electronic display like snow or something where you start to see a pattern in it. Yes. Something, um, Cause that's what you're really doing here is you've got noise and there's a signal in there somewhere or there's parts that you're trying to filter out this, the, the signal from all the noise. Yes. That's what the bartender's doing. There's all this noise in the bar and he's able to focus or she is able to focus on a signal, someone talking. And so this whole filtering of signal, out of the noise, you can do that both on a television screen as well as audio. Uh, can you explain for a minute? Can I just take it on a tangent here? What about Jesus toast? In, in other words, is Jesus's face appearing in the toast? Yeah, sir. And I'm, I'm not. This is not a joke. It's not a joke. No, I mean, and that's I, the thing. Is if it spirits, Jesus on toast? Well, if spirits have the ability to influence sounds in our environment. Can they influence the burning of toast? I think they can. Um, now, why would Jesus's face be appearing on a piece of toast? It's either a coincidence, kind of looks like Jesus, you know. Maybe spirit, uh, a spirit is doing it as a joke because they definitely have a sense of humor. They're just dead people for the most part. Like, it's not like they suddenly become angels or whatever. You just don't have a body anymore. Um these people still have their personalities, their sense of humor. Um, Don't they have I, better things to do than than put Jesus on toast, though? Well, there's there seem to be different realms and different places you can end up in, um, which is part of what I'm exploring. I'm trying to understand this. I've been looking into theosophy and, and things like that 
um, simply because the information that I've gotten is supportive of that. I don't know these concepts, but I'm trying to understand them. But it, it does seem that if you die under certain circumstances, you can kind of get stuck in uh, the shadow realm. It's sort of like the upside down in Stranger Things. Um, the spirits will say that it's like they're here, but everything's dark and they can't interact with things. They can talk, but for the most part, people can't hear. The spirits were super excited that I could hear them. And I would get so many spirits coming through and talking and they would tell me how grateful they were that I was talking to them. But I would also get spirits who were just asking for help. One of the spirits said, I think we may have died. And I was like, what the hell? How can you not know you've died? And he said, we, so he knows there's other spirits around him. And yet then there's spirits and they move on to somewhere else. And I was told with a lot of them that they were, they said they were in heaven. I think they're just using our vocabulary. Um, and they were like, we can't get to them. Like we're not allowed to go and bug them. Um, mm. We're here, they're there, whatever. So there's these different realms what um, you're describing is is a form of spirit prison and a form of spirit paradise. Yeah. Co-located on earth. Would, it kind of sounds it kind of sounds that way. Okay, okay. Can and, I get back to the Jesus toast? Yeah, I was gonna go there myself, but yes, please. Okay, let, okay. Because I, I always ask guests this, I and you know, I'm interviewing, I gotta ask you this. It goes back to the BS detector I always bring up. So because you've talked about pareidolia. And so we've got Jesus on toast. You explain how that could be mediated through the toaster. Right. Right. I mean, maybe I don't, yeah, (laughs) no one's going to hold you to that. I'm just talking, you know, in your mental model here, but what about when you've got Jesus on, on a dog's ass? That's pareidolia, right? Isn't that the difference? Jesus on the ass versus the toast. Well, then, the, then one of those is to, pareidolia. They would have to design the dog's ass to look like Jesus from the dog's birth, you know. And so, I feel like the probability that that's Jesus goes down. But at the same time, I'm like, maybe somebody would see that dog's ass, and it would be, be like, oh, it's Jesus, and that would trigger their ontological shock. And then they might have a spiritually transformative experience and come out of it positive, and it keeps them from committing suicide, right? Um, well, maybe they'd have some toast, right? But let's talk about the dog's ass, right? So maybe somebody sees that they go through this ontological shock, whatever it saves their life. Is it possible that the spirits knew that that was potentially going to be the outcome and they coordinated it ahead of time? I don't think they would do it using a dog's ass. I know what you're talking about because there's a photo floating around. It's it's um, ultra famous. It, yeah, yeah. But, but, well, the reason I but, asked you that, Charles. Yeah. I'm sorry to stop you, but I want to make sure we get this clear because this is, we're going off the range here. Um, when do you know it's pareidolia and when do you know it's not pareidolia? What, how is, what's your BS detector? Do you listen to stuff and you go, no, you, you know, there's a guy up in Canada that does this EVP and he uses the water out of his faucet yep. or he flushes the toilet. Grant, he developed the method that I use actually. Grant Reed. Yeah, yeah. But he's getting he's getting spirits talking through the toilet flushing or the water in his sink, right? He talked to Elvis and Hitler and I'm just you gotta realize I'm 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 I am i am i am i want to say I'm a skeptic. I just Well you, uh, you have to be a skeptic. It's my question is is you need to be a skeptic. When does your BS detector go off? When do you go, nope, this is not what I think it is. This is not Lucifer. It's not Jesus on the ass, it's just pareidolia. Well, how can you tell the difference? You can't. It's different for everyone, first of all. But that image that I made where it was the two pools of water, one bleeding into the other, you could also put that as reality, consensus reality and base reality. There is no delineating line there. It's going to be up to the person in the end to decide what is real and what isn't. Because I, I thought the whole reason I got into EVP and I was excited about it is because it was producing objective evidence. That was my thought. I was finally going to be able to do something where I was going to be able to provide proof of something at the end of it. And I, and I wasn't allowed to have it. It couldn't happen no matter what. Other people can't hear it. Um, they tune out like you play it for them and they're just like they don't 
they're like, there's nothing there at all. I'm like, you can't even hear what sounds like words. And they're like, nope, nothing. And then other people will hear the same thing. One of the other things that was quite difficult was that it turned out they can change recordings. I experienced it. Grant experienced it. Um, one of the other EVP practitioners, Eve, um, she was the one who kind of mentored me while I was getting started on this. She's experienced it too, where they will make a recording and then you go back later and it's something different. And you're like, well, that's got to be pareidolia. I just misheard it the first time. Um, other but, researchers have experienced it too. And the waveform can change. Well, did you, so you can do a checksum on the file, like the file yep. size changes and the file, yep. the checksum actually changes on it. And the waveform changes visibly. So they can, they can, I mean, they're not, again, they're not, they don't seem to be bound by time. Because whatever space they're in is not physical, doesn't seem to be physical space the way we understand it. And if you know anything about physics, um, space and time are, they're connected. And so if you're outside of space, then you're also outside of time. And that was the thing that I had to try and understand, you know? Um, I got recordings where they were talking about me doing something that had happened the day before, but they were talking about it like it was happening at the same time. Now how does a consciousness experience all of time at once or whatever beats me. I don't think I'm capable of grasping that. That's going to always be a question mark to me, but I and plenty of other people have got the evidence that they do it. And they're seeing it. I think it's Skinwalker ranch. I think Skinwalker ranch is just documenting all of the same basic phenomenon. You know, is the thing there a evil spirit? Is it something else? I don't know. There's more than one type of non-human intelligence. There's, It's not just spirits. I don't think. Maybe it's all spirits. Maybe the spirits aren't spirits. Like, I don't know. You can't prove it. You, you um, can't. You can't. All you... I can do is be like, you know, well, they're either all lying or they're spirits. And I'm willing to say they're spirits because just it makes more sense that way it's kind of it's simpler if i apply occam's razor to the evidence i have the simplest explanation is it's actually spirits yes but there is a method to this madness there there is patterns if you look at skinwalker ranch over four seasons if you tune into one episode or even one season you're not getting even close to the full picture you've got to watch all of it and see the patterns because there is a method here there's there's intent but there's also profound purpose and there's patterns right? Um, Brandon just uh, talked on that podcast la last week with Sean Ryan that th the way they made contact with this non-human intelligence, which by the way, they also say is precog, precog, you know, has precognition, was, you know, they had that, they had this severe glitch in the command center where all the electronics were going crazy. And there was the, the main screen on the command center was glitching. And he was able to get a screenshot of it and it's and at the bottom it said I living. And as far as they're concerned, it's you know, if it had said I live, you could have said, well, that's that's only three letters, three, four letters, right? I living is something that's that makes more sense. And then you find out that the security camera was cycling through all the cameras in the command center, and one of them, and they have the label at the bottom of the of the camera for you know, each room as it goes through the rooms, you know, it'll say bedroom and you yeah. know, and one of them was living room. So it got the word living from the living room, but it was just like garbled and it said, I living. So there, can, can you see how it's, there's a method there? There, there there's, yes. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to argue it's long-term and I'm going to go back to the tubular bells, first vision that Lekaski has. I put this on Reddit. It's on the subreddit. You guys can see the details. In summary, this guy, one of the heads of the DIA comes to the ranch he sees the vision of the tubular bells, doesn't know what it is. Later on, realizes it's the album cover for Mike Oldfield's album, Tubular Bells, which he didn't even know turns out to be the theme song for The Exorcist. Message? Okay, hold on. I'm not done yet. This is now coming to light. This, it, in just in the last two months, people are actually talking openly about the fact that Tubular Bells, you know, you know appeared on the ranch, da, 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 da. And I'll tell you, I was a little kid back in 1973 when, when The Exorcist came out, and all hell broke loose. 
We had multi, I was a four year old kid back then, and we had neighbors that lost their shit. They went and saw the movie they're Christians and it just freaked them out. And it, some of them didn't recover from it. Uh, it you can Google it. it. It was crazy. Well, here's what's interesting. So this is now servicing. We're openly talking about the tubular bells exorcist connection to a vision a guy had in the kitchen of some a tube he didn't even recognize. And it was the right color, by the way. And then I just found out that there's a new exorcist movie coming out. They're doing a remake. But I want to get back to my reaction to everything you've been saying about these these voices and your EVP, okay? And, and I want to be I want to be brutally honest. As I hear this, I start to feel concern and fear because I'm afraid it could happen to me. And I get the same way when I I start to listen and I go to the experiencers group and I I listen to um, experiencers talk about their alien abductions. And for me, why that's such a taboo subject is because it makes me feel vulnerable. If these people can just be abducted in their homes, apartments, in the middle of subdivisions, what's to stop them from, from abducting me? Because I don't want that. Does that make sense? It, it, it does make sense. Just yeah, talking about this makes me feel unsafe. That I could see Jesus in toast. I might see the ass of a dog and change my life. Or, 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 you know, grays are going to take me, you know, I think that's a profound thing that people feel when they listen to this, because you know why, Charles, it's real. I mean, I don't have to be persuaded anymore, but I don't know. I have some theories as to kind of how it works a little bit. But how do you make it not happen to you? What if you don't want to be abducted? What if I don't want to hear VP? What if I don't want to see Jesus in the toast? I mean, you can avoid it. How? How do I avoid well, an alien first abduction? First of all, don't go on YouTube. Well, you can't avoid alien abduction. You well, can't. see, that's what but I'm the, saying. But the thing is, things you could get in a car crash too. You can't avoid that either. You know, um, <sighs> well, things well, happen in our lives that we have no control over, and some of the things are very uncommon. Like we don't know how common alien abduction is, but I, you know, I think the estimates for how many people it's happened to are probably overblown. Um, I just don't think it's that many people. And there seems to be a pattern to it. Um, it seems to follow families. And the families tend to have a history of woo experiences. So I think those people are more kind of prepared for it anyway. Are you saying that that's a, there's a genetic component or there's some kind of a family spiritual thing where you hear stories from grandma when you're a kid? And so it's just sort of embedded in your psyche from birth. Or are you talking about a genetic component that's outside of their control? I mean, it could be either. It may be genetic. I mean, this is kind of what Gary Nolan has been investigating. He's looking at the correlation between brain structure and intuition and having anomalous experience. Because people who have this denser um, caudate putamen in their brain, you know, more neuronal connections in there tend to be more intuitive. They feel like they're more often having precognition or, um, you know, a sense of something better at remote viewing, whatever. Those people seem to be more likely to have, to see ghosts, to, um, have abduction phenomenon we don't really know what the connection is there. Now, the beings tell us stuff. The spirits have told me things. NHI aliens tell tell experiencers things about why things are happening, that it was predetermined before they were born. You know, that they chose to have it happen before they incarnated. Yeah, but hold on, hold on. Greys also tell a lot of bullshit. Yes, yeah. They, they've they been do. telling people Earth's going to blow up, and they've been saying that for 30, 40 years. Right. And okay. spirits, spirits also lie to people at times, but for, well, you know, what are their motivations for doing so? Are they ultimately malevolent or benevolent? Um, or, or are they just and, laughing? Is it, are they just dicking with us for the fun of it? Or are they dicking with us? You know, I mean, some of what's going on at Skinwalker Ranch is the trickster, right? It just looks like it's just messing with them for fun, but people have also been severely injured 
at the ranch, life-threatening injuries. That's not funny. At the same time, if you're if you're connected in a spiritual way, like you see the big picture, the human life experience might be, you know, a millimeter on a, a scale that goes a million miles, right? It's a tiny little portion of that. So they may not care at all about your physical existence because they're trying to communicate something to you on a spiritual level, which could be positive. We don't know. Like maybe Brandon and the crew there were destined to go through some ontological shock to give them spiritual awareness. You see, this is what happens when you get, when you, all you need to know is that there's a world out there that, that you can't see where impossible things seem to be possible. Impossible or just highly improbable? Well, highly improbable, I guess. And, and that's it. It's game over at that point. Because you can you can you can come up with any answer you want, and it's and you're like it could be that, you know, maybe Jesus put his face on a dog's asshole for for giggles, you know, maybe it's no, a no. sign of the second coming. He might have done that. It's possible, you know. It's not probable. Here's the deal. But Here, you no, move he into the world where you're like anything becomes possible. This is all about the long game. As soon as you say that this entity is precog, uh, it can see things in the future. Um, it's playing the long game, and you know, the, at the end of the day, we end up talking about Jesus on a dog's ass. We would, you and I, would not be having this conversation. People wouldn't be getting having shits and giggles about it if we didn't actually see that on the internet. And you, you see how there's like a long game. There's a story here. It's almost like the the number one thing that God loves the most is she loves a story. She loves a good story. Like okay, here's another example. Thomas Winterson, he had the the head injury, absolutely life-threatening, very very serious. But now it's they show it on the beginning of every single episode of the of this of the show, right? And, and that's the one thing that like shocks everybody. They see that image of that tumor on his or whatever it was on his head, and poor Thomas had to go through that. But look, look how, what kind of an impact, at, you know, at the end of the day and maybe at the end of the century, whatever's happening on the ranch has, has got to get our attention and it's got to tell a compelling story and it's got to have influence over people. Maybe the whole ranch is just to warn people to stay away from the next, um, the exorcist movie. In other words, it's not really demonic. It didn't pick the exorcist theme song for Tubular Bells for that first vision back in 2007 it was it was for now because now we're talking about it we're aware of it this happens quite often in, in huge movements that start one little simple thing once somebody you know someone goes into a cave and has a vision right uh, you know somebody goes up in a mountain and brings back some commandments you know sees see some nordic angels in a in a in a forest in upstate new york and creates a religion that's got over 600 billion dollars you know it's the long game that this phenomenon seems to have in human history, not the short game. And so that can sort of give you a purpose. And the reason I want to bring this back to ontological shock is because I think that's why it happens. I, I think this entity is looking out, maybe maybe on your deathbed, maybe 20 years from now, maybe someone's life you're going to save, maybe a movement you're going to start. You, you never know the long game, and yet you have these horrific ontological, you see a grasshopper when you're a kid, a giant, you know, a mantis. You, you see what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense at the time at all. It's nonsensical. And even in the future. But look at you now. You're sitting here talking. You've been talking for an hour about EVP. And the reality, I should say, the reality of EVP, how many people are going to hear this now? How many lives are you going to change? And I would argue that if you do change people's lives by what you've just said in your experiences, that's why you had them. And those entities at the same time, that's where they were talking to you through the shop vac. They have they they understand the long game. I know you don't believe in a block universe, but you, you do believe in the long self that you have a future and we have a past, and we just we're just too close to it when things actually happen to us. But 10, 20 years out, a lot of these ontological shock experiences make complete sense to people. They're glad they happened, and they 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 wouldn't have wanted to live their lives without it, knowing they only have one life.
So I think that this whole phenomenon is, is incredibly profound at a spiritual level. If you if you take that eternal perspective, you've got to have an internal perspective on it because it is eternal itself. That this phenomenon is eternal because it's out of time and space, right? Right. And do, do you disagree with any of that, or am I just? No, I don't I, disagree with any of am that. I, or am it, I just putting some the, shit on toast? No, no. The way people can interpret this, anybody can interpret this in a different way. And let me give you a completely different example. So we've talked about remote viewing. I think we're both in agreement. Remote viewing is a real thing. I've done it. I'm convinced of it. Charles, Charles, undeniable. Okay. There's too much science behind it. No. Right. And, and, and for our viewers, Beyond Skinwalker Ranch episode with Katie they did the world's largest remote viewing exper scientific experiment, right? And then they didn't put it in the episode. Yeah. So it's absolutely undeniable. And I, when people see that, they're they're going to understand that this is real. So I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so I'm, I'm just saying, you know, so if you accept remote viewing is real, people have the ability to see outside of time and space. Um. Seeing into the future is harder, but it can be done. The way the government was doing it, you know, they used teams of people because what they found was that, you know, individually, a remote viewer, even a really good one, only about 65% accuracy. But if you get, you know, five of them and they're saying similar things, you take all the things that are very similar between them and you go, we're more confident in this. Now, do you think the government is going to give up the ability to see through time and space? No, absolutely not. They're not going to tell people about it because they the, the uh -oh. giant stink that was raised before about tax dollars going to fund, you know, psychics and woo and blah, blah, blah. So they divested themselves of it or it's just gone down into a, you know, super secret project. Right. And they and they declare it's not real, right? They yes. say, oh, no, it didn't work. This is all bullshit. We're not going to spend any more money. It was a waste of time. A couple of people died. It was a big mistake. It's bullshit. Yep. Right. And they do it. And then they just go underground and just keep and doing so it. If the government has the capability of then looking to the future to see potentially how outcomes might change on things. In other words, I guess the, the point that I'm going to make, and I'll make it shorter, um, the phenomenon is playing the long game. But if you're in a certain mindset, you can imagine conspiratorially that the government is also playing a long game or private corporations are playing a long game. And then you start to be like, well, you know, it's possible that some psychics um, communicated with spirits via EVP and they told them to go into the past and you know, get the guy to see the tubular bells at Skinwalker Ranch. And the whole thing is a marketing project for the next Exorcist movie. Now, somebody could come to this conclusion. I mean, I could tell you, yeah, that's possible. I mean, I don't, I think it's improbable. But based on the things that I've learned, I think it's possible. Well, some, if you're in the right mindset, you, you will fully buy into that. If you're a very conspiratorial person, now, if you go and tell somebody else that, you know, you're going to end up on the street begging for money. You know, you buy into that kind of stuff. So this is an example of where, you know, going through ontological shock, you can still come out on the other side of it and not end up in a better place. You got to be really careful guarding your own thoughts and deciding what you're going to buy into. So, you know, if you ask me, are spirits real? I'll be like, I think so. I, yeah, did, yeah. Did I communicate with them? I think so. Is there an afterlife? I think so. Right. Yeah. We should not hold on to any of this firmly. This should, like 38 Special used to saying, hold on, hold on to this loosely. You, you, you can't really grasp any of this. You know, my theory about the tubular bells, let me defend myself a little bit. There's a huge difference between just coincidences, which we all have. And those are just potentially highly improbable events. They're just random and there are coincidences. Not everything's a coincidence. There are coincidences, but they're meaningless. That's what a coincidence is. It's a meaningless, improbable event that you observe. But when there's a coincidence that's very profound and meaningful for you, it has meaning. And that's what I'm saying. It wasn't a coincidence that the DIA 
lead, saw bell, a, a tube with a certain color and shape, later saw, we're stepping through the coincidences here. Where do the probabilities go, right? He sees these this tube, then he realizes later it's this album cover. He doesn't know it was in the Exorcist movie. Someone else longer down the road figures it out. And now we're talking about it. So to me, that's a synchronicity because it's a profound, profoundly meaningful, at least for me, set of circumstances that actually is trying to tell us something, I think. Maybe I'm misinterpreting the message, but the phenomenon is trying to communicate with us something right i mean it, this yeah. isn't just randoms it could have been any album cover it didn't even have to be an album cover it could have been anything it could have been it could have been toast it could have been a dog's ass yeah right it could have been um the phenomenon can not, do whatever if, the hell it wants why did it do that and i think it's trying to tell us it picked an album cover for a reason and it the fact that that's the one album cover for the theme song to the exorcist I'm the one that's jumping the conclusions that there's another movie coming out and all hell is going to break loose again in the Christian community. You know, kids are going to watch this movie. It's going to be on Netflix. It's going to be, it's not going to be in a theater R rated like it was back in 1973. It's, it's going to get a lot of exposure and it's about demonic, satanic, Catholic possession. So that's my profound meaning. I'm sorry. I'm, I went on a tangent there, but there's a huge difference between coincidences, even a series of coincidences and a very profound, meaningful, and that's what I call a synchronicity. Right, right. And so you but, always need to ask yourself, okay, this is this weird thing. Is it a meaningless coincidence or set of circumstances, or does this have a profound meaning? And maybe that is a subjective thing, but the, the two bitter bells and the cat ski, then, that's almost like a religious first vision. That's almost the beginning of some kind of bizarre movement, Right. It could be. Somebody could turn it into one. You could do that with any of this stuff. Well, not not Jesus is uh, not uh, not a dog's ass. Well, you're not going to get a lot of followers, but well, you'll you know, follow the dog, right? You might, yeah. If you well, you have to if you want to see the see the ass. You're going to have to follow it. Boy, there's a lot of there's a lot of comedy in that, isn't there? <laughs> we got to keep this but light. What you said <laughs> at the end, though, about it being subjective, that was my point. In circumstances, uh, sorry, in coincidences. There's noise. They're meaningless. But every once in a while, there's a series of coincidences that aren't meaningless. There's a signal. Yes. It's just like my EVP. But what I'm saying is that even that's subjective because I can of course. hear stuff in it that, that other people can't. I can't. I don't, I don't get much out of it. When uh, my friend shows up, I hear it. And it's very profoundly meaningful to me. Yeah. There's my signal in the noise. Yep. But I can't understand a, hardly any of the other stuff that you've sent me, unfortunately. I hear it sounds like it, but I don't get meaning from it. I don't get a signal. I'm not getting information. That's what a signal is, 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 is meaningful information. And noise is meaningless noise. That's what we're talking about. All this goes back to signal versus noise. It's just the strength of the signal for each person is somewhat different. And it's very individual and it's very personal. The person next to you doesn't get the signal and you do. Yeah. They just get the and, noise. And that's what's maddening, you know, is that yes. whole personal component to this, which is why I think ultimately the phenomenon does seem to revolve a lot around altering our consciousness in some way. It seems like it's doing it maybe to give people an awareness of the greater reality for whatever reason. Um, but it would seem that way. Yeah, in and, lieu of in lieu of any other definitive answer, and we don't have one. You know, people are given answers, but they're they're different, and maybe that's because there is no one answer. Maybe there's a, a huge variety of different reasons that people do have these experiences, and that the things that they're being told are true. I mean, at least one person who's had an experience was probably not being lied to. At least one of them. Right. We don't right, assume that right. every being that communicated with a person in some way was lying about it. And so at some point you end up being like, well, what am I going to decide to believe? How do I choose? And it's really going to align with whatever your worldview is. You know, you're going to go with whatever already kind of makes sense to you. Unless your worldview is completely shattered on the floor and the water goes everywhere. Yeah. A religious person, I would come out of this in a very different place than, you know, than I am. 
I am coming out more spiritual than I was when I went into it. I mean, <laughs> how could I not? You know, I talk to spirits, but spirits aren't real. You know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but that's not religious. Spiritual is not religious. They're, they're, yeah, religion and spiritual is completely, they're not even the same universe. They're completely I, separate. Um, I want to go back to what you said about the, the government potentially um, playing a long game through remote viewing because they can see the future and they're planning events. And here's the thing. That's all mediated by the phenomenon itself. And Brandon says, and I believe him, that this thing is the, the, the non-human intelligences are not only are they precog, but they're always three steps ahead of them. And if this thing is always three steps of humans, no matter how many eggheads you have in the basement of the Pentagon, they're not going to figure this shit out. And it's always going to be one step. They're going to get played, right? They're going to get played as much as everybody else by this thing. I don't think anyone can weaponize it. Not unless that. I sure hope not. It's impossible. The only way they can weaponize it is if the phenomenon itself facilitates it because yeah. it's an intelligence. It's an independent intelligence. But, okay, let's talk about Skinwalkers, right? Skinwalker Ranch, it's right there in the name, Skinwalkers. The whole, the whole mythos is about the Skinwalker. And Brandon talked about this in a recent interview. And so the idea with the Skinwalker, it's a Navajo legend. It's about a witch they have to kill a member of their family, do various things, and they go into a pact. They give up their soul, and they go into a pact with some aspect of the phenomenon, some non-human intelligence, a demon, a spirit, whatever it is, that is able to then give them powers and abilities that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, do, do we accept that that is possible? But I do want to say... Um, we're not, neither one of us is trying to minimize. No, no, you know, no, no, because no, this no, is, no, no. this is a very important belief apparently among the Navajo. They take I, it very seriously. I, I take a, it very, it's very not seriously. It's a fringe belief. No, no, no. Um, I take it very, very seriously. They had a whole episode of, uh, Beyond Skinwalker Ranch on it. Yeah. No, I, I'm sorry. I, you asked me if I, you know, what I thought of Skinwalkers. And so I'm, I'm trying to seeing that in, I'm so, trying to seeing that through the lens of how stories influence the masses. Whether the stories are true or not, Chris Bledsoe's story of seeing the 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 angel, he calls it an angel, right? Some people say it's a Nordic. Some people say it's the Virgin Mary. Oh, I the don't lady. know. The, la the lady. Sorry, the lady. No, the, the lady, yeah. See, the, you know, what I'm compelled by is the story itself and how it's influencing people one way or the other, right? Is that 2000... 26 date or 2027 is coming up a lot we've talked about it yes it seems to be influencing a lot of people now is that is it chris is that who's influencing them or is it, it okay i'm gonna I, this it's is a, a perfect opportunity i finally get to talk about this so eve uh i mentioned is another person who's doing this evp i definitely have faith in in her ability and her communication with the spirits and she's asked them, the spirits have brought it up themselves. Now, I should I don't want to freak anybody out, by the way. We have to note, and we've said it before, not only do the spirits lie, they're wrong. Like the especially when they make predictions about the future, things change. Um, but even they have said some major changes coming. And they're like, in the end, it's gonna be it's gonna be very positive, but it's gonna be a wild ride. And so we're getting this from all these different directions. And so you just, you go, well, what do you do with this information? Like people are talking about it a lot. They're bringing it up and they're like, well, can you prepare? What are we, what are we preparing for? This is again, where I'm just like, you know, look, we can't, even if we're, we're opening ourselves up and being like, some of these concepts are real um, without a doubt we don't know how it works. We don't know what it means. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't be making any life decisions or, or anything. I don't want anybody to be going into ontological shock based on what we're talking about, you know, like, uh, oh my God, skinwalkers are real or, you know, oh my God, spirits are real or whatever. I, I want you to take these things and be like, I'm, I'm interested enough in this to consider it and look into it. 
but don't change your life around it. You know, like in other words, don't, I don't want to say don't change your life around it because you can have a positive life altering experience. But what I want to say is don't, don't ruin your life. Well, well Charles, <laughs> I know that's, that's kind of arbitrary, but I we appreciate... talked earlier about how to not go into ontological shock. And I'm saying, be careful, you know, do the things we talked about. Yeah. But we've, I mean, we've at the same time, we've kind of gone a little, we've gone way deep down in the rabbit hole. We've lost. We have, but that was kind of the point, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, well, I, I guess, um, <laughs> but uh, listen, what I need to understand at the end of the day is what good comes from doing a deep dive into the, into the paranormal. Why not just stay away from this? Why spend three hours of your day? Listen to this, listen to you and I talk. What goods comes from, from all of this watching skin A to Z, the whole discussion we've had in every, every topic, what good comes from any of this? When I can just live my life like the, the, this is all bullshit. What good comes from this? The understanding that impossible things can happen. In other words, and it, this is especially important for people who are incredibly depressed and feel stuck and in a rut and hopeless and everything else is that you can't predict the future. You can't even like, this is what I was doing was because I'm a very logical person. My therapist described to me as hyper rational. I would analyze everything and I was analyzing my life and I was looking at all of it. And I was like, the outcome of this is, is not good. It's just not, no, in no equation can I come up with a, a answer where things work out okay. And then all the woo stuff started happening. And the final conclusion I came to is I don't have the answers. Like I can't predict what is going to happen. And that's proven to be true. Things have happened that I absolutely could not have predicted that were, you know, life-saving things, life-changing things. And they wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been open to it. If I had just closed the door on it or tried to, you know, rapidly debunk it which I easily could have done. I could have just debunked it. Could have done none of this. Just been like, ah, it's all paranoia. Wouldn't you have been better off? No, I would not. My life would have been simpler, but it would not have been better. But that's me. That doesn't, that's not necessarily true for everyone. And you have the choice to ignore this stuff. And I think that's a lot of how the phenomenon works is it gives people the, the option. You don't have to dig into this. Like, you're living the human experience, you know, live it. You don't have to have anything. You don't have to go outside of it if you don't want to, but it's there if you want to explore it. And if you, you say, I want to engage in it, it'll engage with you. Right. And as we've already said, the intensity of some of these stories and events and experiences actually repels people away from the phenomenon. A lot of people think that orbs and other things, or maybe even some of the shape-shifting, the dino beavers that show up or not show up on Skinwalker Ranch, it's trying to scare people off. It's trying to ward people off. It's trying to get people to not be curious about what's buried in the mesa or what's above the tri. I mean, this is, I'm theorizing, I've heard this from, we read this on Reddit every day, right? That the phenomenon isn't necessarily attracting everyone. For other people, it's trying to get, get them to turn away from it, avoid it. And a lot of people that are listening to this, we've scared them off. And I think that's that's part of this too. It could be, yeah. Everybody's on a different path. Not everybody needs to go through ontological shock. Not everybody needs to have these experiences. Um, the people who do, I think they're going to have them. It'll happen one way or another. You can avoid it as long as you want, but if if you know it's kind of destined to happen... It'll happen. It's it's kind of like we're riding the rapids, right? We don't control where the rocks or the waves take us, but we've got this little paddle in our boat and we're wearing our little helmet and we're just going to try to make it through, right? And you really can't prepare for what's going to happen. Listen, everybody who survived COVID, the COVID bullshit on this planet who went through that, it was that was a collective trauma globally. We've all gotten the pit of our gut that something big is going to happen. Another big, we know what a global event is. You know, my whole life they talked about, oh, there's going to be a pandemic. And then when it happened, you, 
you, you can never unsee it. You can never unexperience it. And we all know what it's like to have a global event that shocks everybody. That's what COVID bullshit was all about. Those people that were locked up in China screaming out of their windows for two months. You know, I, you know, I, we've all been there in some way or another. And so when we talk about some kind of an event that, a that, a a lady is warning us about it, it, if anything, it's just to prepare us mentally that, yeah, shit's going to go down. And then we see things like what's happening in, in Hawaii, right? With the inferno there. And, you know, in the back of our minds, you know, is it coming for us? I don't know. But I think this is all, there's a lot of psychic energy around this. You see it online. All the, I see it on Twitter. I see it on Reddit, all over the place. People are just sort of on edge and they don't know what it is, but they just feel like, something else is coming along here and you can't physically prepare for it, but I think you can spiritually prepare for it. If that makes sense, just get to know your neighbors better is a great place to start or the things you've, you know, the prepare yourself for ontological shock. Would yeah. you, would you agree that whatever the thing is that's out there in 2026 um, is, is basically a, a global ontological shock potentially? That's my guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's going to be, you know, people talk about the veil. It's like having the veil pulled back. I think it, it's not going to be the necessarily the individual experience. It's going to be that collective experience. Something may happen where everyone suddenly goes, oh my God, this reality is not what I thought it was. And if that does happen to, you know, everyone at once in some way or even just a majority of people um you know how do you deal with that <laughs> like it's going to be it's going to be hard to get through that because society is going to come to a stop everybody's going to have to take a breath at least um, for a day right at least for God, one day the, the benefit on the other side of it could be tremendous um it could bring everyone together and make them care more about you know, the future and the planet and yeah. Yeah. And their behavior, their own behavior. Our behavior really matters. The things we do matter. Not if there's no life after death. Um, so I'm going to note, I'm, I just started hearing communication, by the way, I have a fan on across the room. I haven't heard anything this entire talk. Just started hearing something. Um, and in an interview that I did with Oak Triok, um On this podcast. On this podcast. Yeah. Some people pointed out to me. They were like, was there a radio on in the background? I'm hearing voices. There's someone talking in the background. And I was like, yeah, that was, there was talking. I was hearing the talking while I was doing it. And it was the ambient sounds were being modulated. It was a fan going on in the background. And some other people did hear it. And if you go and you listen to the podcast, you might you might catch some of it. <laughs> so there is some recording of it there. You don't just have to look my stuff up. But um, you're you're also getting some camera distortion right now. And you and throughout this discussion, you've been glitching out. Am I? Uh, and and very also, speci very specific moments you've been glitching out this whole that, time. Doesn't that sound like Skinwalker Ranch, where all the technology starts to glitch when things are happening? Or it could just be Jesus on the dog's ass. Or it could be Jesus on the dog's ass. Yep. You just got to leave it open and be like, could be, I don't know. Hold but on loosely. It, yeah, hold on loosely. <laughs> I, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about this. I haven't, you know, I haven't talked about it a lot because um, I know how it sounds. But I do think it's important. Uh, and you don't have to believe me. You can go just look at the research or look at other people or do whatever. But I would tell people, I think, you know, whatever it is, there is something greater out there. There's far more than just what we see with our limited senses. Even my cat sees more than I do and hears more than I do. And we shouldn't ignore it. We should just have an awareness of it at a minimum. Anything else you'd like to say as we uh, round up? And I ask people to subscribe and like the video and please comment on this. We... We love the feedback. We love the comments. Even if you think this is crazy, please let us know. We love all the feedback on these videos so we know where to go next with all this stuff. Um, we've got some other guests coming up pretty soon. 
we're working on some other ones. We haven't had some podcasts for all just because Brandon's been very busy with a lot of things and we haven't been able to line up some of the guests that we wanted. Um, but those, those guests are still coming. We still want to do the AMA. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yep. We want to do the AMA um, as well. So, and we've got a new, a new moderator. We want to, we want to introduce to everybody as well. So we've got a lot going on, but I'm going to let you have the last word, Charles. What, what do you want to say? I guess the last thing I would say is if you decide to engage with things in some way, like CE5 or EVP or whatever, if at any point you get scared, stop, stop what you're doing and just take a pause and, and assess and, you know, um, don't just don't rush blindly into things because we don't know what we're dealing with that's out there and people have gotten hurt. Um, and so just be cautious. That's all. I just want to make sure I say that. Take okay. Care. Great. Thanks, Charles. Thank you very much. It was great to talk to everybody. <laughs>